Hello and welcome to the Amherst Conservation Commission meeting um, on October 23rd, 2024. The time is 7.04. We have all members present except Laura and we have staff present Aaron Jock and Dave Zomick. Okay. Um, first up is Chair's report. I don't have anything tonight, so I'll hand it over to Dave. Sure, I, I usually like to give you a couple of quick updates and I've got three for you. One is um, some weeks back, I think we reported and you probably saw in the newspaper that uh, the, the town was successful in getting that Puffers Pond uh, grant, $250,000. We're really excited about that. Uh, Aaron did some some great work on that with um, with uh, some of the uh, team that we brought in um, to put that grant together. We're going to match that with some capital funds that I have for Puffers Pond, and we're going to be working with uh, one of our other team members, Bob Parent, on kicking that off. The three of us met earlier in the week, and uh, so the 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 background on that is is the grant is for designing and um, uh, permitting. Uh, improvements to the dam and dike at Puffers Pond. This is kind of a an important first phase in our in our relook in our focus on on what's happening up at Puffers with regard to dredging and um, sedimentation in the pond um, and and improving the beaches and the access and such. So, um, going to be exciting process. Again, this is for design and permitting. It is not for the actual construction. Um, we will be working uh, to get additional grant funding and, and hopefully capital funding to uh, move that along, but very much needed work on, on the dam and dike. Again, there's no, there's no immediate threat to those, to those uh, structures, but um, uh, they do need some TLC. Um, switching gears going all the way south to Hickory Ridge. I don't want to steal Aaron's thunder, but um, again, Aaron has done some great work cultivating uh, collaborations there. And I think Aaron and I met earlier today, and I believe uh, we are at seven culverts removed total on that property, Aaron. And just this week, again, thanks to uh, uh, partnerships that Aaron has has cultivated with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, they removed uh, two culverts last week, or maybe three last week, and one this week. So. Um, uh, our partners at U.S. Fish have done an amazing job, and these are tributaries to the Fort River and. You know, we don't have a total value on this partnership, but it certainly exceeds $100,000 in construction, materials, labor, all of that, uh, equipment rental, et cetera, et cetera. So we're really grateful for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for their partnership on that on that project. And then lastly, um, uh, we did team up and get in some CPA proposals for um, conservation support. Um, there are, are, and I believe Jason is going, and Jason and I have not connected on this. I know you sent me an email and I apologize. I haven't gotten back to you on that, but, um, the CPA committee will be meeting later this fall to consider 11 proposals. These are from town departments, as well as from, uh, organizations out in the community. We were able to get in two proposals. One is for, uh, the purchase and installation of signs and kiosks at conservation areas. And that was for a hundred thousand dollars. And then um, another proposal for trails and uh, trail improvements and and footbridge replacements and upgrades, uh, and that was for one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. So uh, we're doing the very best we can to seek um, significant support for the conservation land. And um, as we know, these things, you know, when you're replacing bridges, um, whether they be bog bridges or or bridges over tributaries, um, the cost is very real. Um, the days of of doing telephone poles and and um, you know some donated labor or excuse me donated uh, materials is probably over. So um, along with the signs and kiosks, we're also I've mentioned we are working with we've hired a, a designer Seth Gregory out of Northampton. He has extensive experience with um, designing signs for a lot of different organizations including, I believe, the trustees of reservations, the Kestrel Trust, et cetera, et cetera. So we're, um, as soon as we have some design concepts, uh, we will bring those to you. But we're doing conservation areas, recreation areas, and cemeteries. Um, and so uh, we're looking for kind of a consistent brand so that people would know 
you know, when you drive by area A or area B, conservation area B or recreation area C, you know that the town owns it, the town manages it. And once you got to that area, be it a parking lot or a trailhead, you know, what are the rules and regulations and um, a map and um, also who to call if you see issues or, or have questions. So we're thinking about QR codes and, and how to best do that. So we're very early in the process, but um, as soon as we have some, some concepts, we will bring those to you. Um, but it's pretty exciting. I know that I've spoken to a couple of members of the commission about how inconsistent we are with our presentation at various uh, trailheads and parking areas. So we're well aware of the issue. We've got empty kiosks, we've got old kiosks. This would help to standardize them across the town. So kind of exciting stuff. So happy, Great. To, Thanks, Dave. happy to take any questions if you haven't. Looks, looks like Alex has a question. Go ahead, Alex. I just want to provide an update to Dave on um, closures of area uh, ponds. I was visiting with somebody about Lake Wyola. And then with the, on the north end where the beach is, it's sandy and it's frequented by geese. The E. coli um, count around that area was very high and caused it to close. But in other parts of, of the pond, um, the E. coli count was down. So it appeared that the E. coli, coli count wasn't uniform across the water and was concentrated where the geese was. And I noticed in the video of you that's on the Amherst TV, oh, um, the ducks were keeping mallards everybody. swimming around while you're being videoed. And I wonder if there aren't a lot of uh, waterfowl on puffers. Yeah, it's a great comment. Great question, Alex. Um, and, and certainly something we're going to be looking into uh, more closely. And, and in fact, Aaron had spoken to me about this some some weeks back uh, that she was well aware from her colleagues or friends uh, up in Shutesbury that like Wyola, the folks there did some interesting testing both at the beach, at the uh, state beach, but also at the various private beaches around the pond or lake and um, found the same thing. So I think it's kind of the same information getting to us. And yeah, we're planning to do some more extensive testing around the perimeter of puffers this summer. And as I said, we are hopeful that our partnership with UMass with additional testing is going to, to happen in the summer of 25 as well. Um, working with Brian Yellen on that. And, and my hope is uh, that UMass will um, step up with some funding for that. So uh, we're, we're hopeful on all of that. We're also gonna chase some of that testing up the Cushman Brook. So, and yeah, ducks, we, we haven't, to your question about ducks, we haven't had a significant number of geese or ducks on the pond for a couple of years, but, you know, wildlife is wildlife and they do do what they want to do. So they fly in, they fly out. Sounds like you have an imminent comment, Erin. I was just going to say, I drove by <laughs> Puffers the other night because I drive by a lot just to check it out. Oh, and no, I geese? saw... I saw a flock of about 30 ducks on that sandbar that's right at the mouth of the Cushman. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, I, I almost like called you to be like, you got to come see this or like stop to take a picture. But anyway. Were you almost called me or Alex? You. <laughs> um, another reason to dredge, I guess. Right. Because that sandbar is uh, just yeah, an attractive growing, well, growing, growing. Um, it is migration season, so there's not no normally 30 ducks there in the summer when the E. coli mm -hmm. is high. So I just want to point out the timeline period and not That's blame right. the ducks yeah. entirely. But yes, um, it is goose and duck congregation season. Okay, I don't see any more hands, so I'll just move on to our land management updates and hand this over to Alex. Go ahead, Alex, please. We have... <clears throat> I think a vote coming up on the agricultural policy tonight, if I'm not mistaken, and um, we'll let Aaron handle that, I think. If there are any questions on the agricultural policy, I'd like to have Bruce address them because he was the primary author. And hats off to Bruce for that. He did a wonderful job. Uh, we have um, a couple of items 
in the folder for the subcommittee uh, for your review and comment. One is the mission statement. And with that is uh, Appendix A and B. Uh, B is a set of definitions, some of which uh, define the, some of the words in the mission statement. So please look at them together. Um, <clears throat> we also have um, a forest management document in there, which um, you got a, a kind of a raw document. It has Bruce's comments. And I told Aaron today that I plan to uh, um, update that as soon as possible. Um, so we'd appreciate it if you would look at the forest management document in between now and the next commission meeting. And we have another document in there, uh, which I got to refresh my memory on just what that is. Um, the mission statement, I think, Alex. I think I said mission. Forestry I have, management. I, I think we have three, three, don't we? Forestry management, agricultural policy, acronyms and definitions and uh, the mission statement. Those are four. Yeah, okay. So we're starting to uh, roll things to you and uh, uh, so that we can make our deadline at the end of December and hopefully have everything voted on uh, individually. Um, you'll eventually see the entire document, but they're really not linked. So I don't think there's a conflict with voting on things as they come up. And it will hopefully uh, allow us to conclude the subcommittee at the end of December when we'll go into another phase of that. So um, there's, there's, we'll continue to roll things out. And we have uh, a couple of policies going to come at you um, next time. And uh, the pace will probably pick up. So if I'm correct, and I think I am, that we're going to have a vote on the agricultural policy, it would please me if if uh, Aaron would, or, or Michelle would lead that rather than me. I think I have a bias. Thanks, Alex. Sounds good. Okay, so first up, are there any commissioner questions on the agricultural policy? Comments? Is that hand, Rachel? Go ahead. Um, no, very nice editing. Um, I just had one question about the policy was at the end, I know we had the definition of temp temporary and permanent structure, and it's also listed in the definition section. So I don't know if we need them in both places or if we want to refer to the definition section rather than re reiterating that in the agricultural section. I think that was the intent is to have the uh definitions all at the end of the whole document. Okay. That's a great comment. I would prefer to just reference the, the definition sections that could be updated and re-referenced in prior and subsequent iterations of it. Go ahead, Alex. That's the intent. It'll be a rolling working document and uh, subject to change as different policies come forward. So the definitions that are there now will only change as a result of comments received. What will happen is new definitions will be added for other words. Thanks. Okay. Does, does Rachel's comment necessitate an edit to the document, to the agricultural policy text? I wasn't quite sure exactly what her comment was. It sounded like we have defined something in the policy and again in the... Uh, right in the um, uh, appendix and we'll need to straighten that out. Thank you, Rachel. Sure. Yeah, so let's strike the redundant or let's strike the agricultural policy definition and just refer to the appendix. Is that? Yes, satisfy? please. Yeah. Great. Erin? I was just going to say, I think that how we've been, I think Alex's thought was include the definitions in each section. That way, when you're reviewing it, if you want to see the definition while we're doing the review, you have access to it. But the idea is that those definitions will be collated in the definition section. It's just as they're applicable to a given section, we're trying to include them so that it's helpful when you're doing the review. Got it. Jason? Can you clarify what it is that we're just voting on that? I the land use policy, right? The 
Amherst. We're voting on the agricultural policy of the land use policy. Draft, yeah, draft yeah. 18, final two. Yeah. Okay. So any comments that we have for appendix A and B, you want us to just write them down and send them in, right? Yes, please. Make any comment right now. <clears throat> yeah. But if we'd like to vote on approval of the agricultural policy tonight. In which case, I have, there's a, no... I have a, just a point of clarification. And Dave, if you have an opinion, um, I don't know if we have a conflict on the subcommittee. If, if the subcommittee doesn't vote, I don't know if we have a quorum. But does the subcommittee have a conflict of interest in voting? I think this is all our purview. Okay, just thought I'd ask. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So I guess if there's, I mean, if there's any public comment, please raise your hand on this. Otherwise, I'm looking for a motion to approve the agricultural policy section of the conservation land use policy document. There we go. Motion's up. I move to approve the agricultural section of the conservation land use policy. I second. Rachel on the motion, Jason on the second. Bruce? Aye. Jason? Aye. <laughs> Andre? Aye. Uh, Alex? Aye. Rachel, did I get you? Aye. And I'm an aye. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, you, you folks have no idea how much time and effort Bruce put in <laughs> this committee put Thank in. Thank you, Bruce. Well, I appreciate that, but it's like this is the first one that's gotten approved too. We've yeah. got other sections, and it's like, yes, now we've got something to work with here. All right. Yeah. Thank you all. And Thank just you. to reiterate Bruce's effort, this went out for review by local farmers and community members. So it was a very well-researched section and I think we can be proud of it. Erin, go ahead. And I just wanted to, because we have a large contingent of the public in attendance, just remind people that this is sort of an administrative process that the commission's going through approving section by section. But when this document is fully drafted at the end there is going to be a public hearing for public review and we'll make the documents available on mm -hmm. um, the website so that you can review the documents in advance of the public hearing um, so that we can take public comment on them and also if you're interested in joining we meet um, twice a month the first and third Tuesday at noon typically for the land management subcommittee if you want to attend or participate to see what the editing of these documents looks like. And, and that also applies to the other commissioners. Yeah, if there's a specific um, section you're interested in, reach out and we'll let you know when it's under discussion. Okay, great. Um, so the mission statement is also on my agenda. Go ahead, Alex. I just want to warn anybody who tunes in on Tuesdays, if you've ever made sausage, uh, it's a messy process until you find the casing. So that's what it's kind of like, making sausage. <laughs> there you go. And in the end, it's fantastic, I guess. <laughs> okay. Um, is there another component of this that we need to vote to move or discuss before I move on to other business? I think that's the only one that's up. Okay, we'll, uh, great. In the future... We can look forward to having multiple votes. Yeah. But this was the first, and it's also the biggest policy. Right. In terms of, in terms of length. Great. Okay. Um, I'm going to move on to other business. And um, okay. So we have seven minutes. I have something um, quick that I'd like to push Please to do. the front if we can. Go ahead. Um, <clears throat> So in the in your packets, this is not on the agenda. It was an item that came up after the agenda was posted, but um, it's a fairly urgent item. Um, and I think I saw Tom Reedy on the call in case we need him. Um, so I'm just going to give you a quick overview and then I'll pull Tom in. So um, it's 162 Southeast Street. This is a house relocation project. You may have heard of it. Um, it's 
relocation of a historic house from uh, 162 Southeast Street to the project we approved, which was through an RDA on the corner of Harkness Road and Belchtown Road a couple weeks ago. Um, in the course of all of the planning to move this house, um, it it was brought to the um, project manager essentially's attention that um, they, because of a utility pole that's on the corner um, of the property line, they have to uh, put some timber mats on um, the edge of the driveway in order to accommodate the moving of the house. Um, there is an isolated, a small pocket of isolated wetland in that corner that the timber mats would be set on. Um, and this would be extremely temporary, like a um, matter of, you know, a, a, a couple hours to a day to have the timber mats put in place and then have the um, timber mats taken back up once the house is moved and then, you know, reseed down the area where the, the mats were. So, um, because this is like imminent, like it's happening in a matter of days, um, the request was sent to the commission. There's um, information in the folder, uh, uh, formal correspondence from Tom, and there's photos showing what the wetland looks like. It's a corner of uh, the, the northwest corner of um, Colonial Village Apartments where it abuts the driveway and it's a very small um, wet area of the lawn essentially that um, they're looking to put the mats in. So I'll pull Tom in um, if he's, if I can find him and uh, if anybody has any questions. Erin, this folder has been empty on my access for days and still is. So if you do have material Maybe you could pull it up because I if any okay. other, I saw Andre shaking his head. Same here. So I think yeah. So I don't think okay. anybody's had the opportunity to see any pictures or see any correspondence on this. Got it. Okay. Sometimes when I add hey, stuff to the folders, it's not visible. So I apologize. I'm gonna try to re-upload it right now. Um, okay. And, and maybe I'll let put you guys... it on your screen. Yep. Yes, I'll do that. Bear with me one second while you, you guys can talk to Tom and Hopefully he can provide some more insight on the situation while I do so, this. Sure, Tom, is there anything you want to add about it? Yeah, so I guess first it would be with our apologies. I think, you know, so this is Barry's project. I think, you know, Barry, by now, if he knew about this, we would have been here before. It was one of the things that the the building movers just told him last week. Um, he had said, here's what we've got to do. I just, some historical knowledge know through working with Alan Cohn that there's that isolated wetland that I can share my screen if Erin can't uh, get hers to display. Um, from when Alan had stockpiled some soil, it was delineated. It really was caused by the, the creation of Southeast Street kind of damming the water. When you see the photos, it's, I mean, you are you're all professionals it looks like a kind of a mown grass area um but i said barry it's that's a wetland let me talk to erin this move is scheduled for next tuesday and we've got you know sign offs from all the utilities eversource verizon town of amherst etc we got the police because um we will be going out and maybe i'll share my screen just so you get a sense of uh if you want to uh, yeah let me Tom, it's not working on my screen to share it. They're showing up as like icons when I try to share the photos. Sure. Um, so if you could share the photos, that'd be great. Sure. And, and first, if you can see my screen, just for some context, this is 162 Southeast Street. You know, to zoom out, Colonial Village, Route 9 right here, uh, Southeast Street continues to go right here, um, Northampton Cooperative Bank. So it's this structure that Barry is it's if you go out there it's probably jacked up right now because the building movers are out there um it is going to if you follow my my mouse these trees don't exist here you'll see that in the picture uh the house will come out this garage is being taken down the foundation is being removed and it's being um revegetated it's being filled in and that's a minor activity we talked to Aaron about that but the house is going to come out and when it it's as you'll see in the photo, there is a, a pole. I think it's right here. And so the house has to come out this way to swing around. 
to head this way. We had talked originally with Alan Snow about going south, but he didn't want us to go down Stanley Street because of all the vegetation that would have to be cleared in order to move the house. And he didn't want to lose any of those trees along Stanley. And, you know, to belabor it a little bit, Stanley is if you travel down here, you would come down here and then loop around to Route 9. Um, so instead of doing that, the decision was made, pick a number of months ago to go north, move these traffic lights, and then travel all the way down Belchertown Road to that Harkness Road property. So again, when the building movers came out, they said, well, wait a second, we can't just make this turn. And I'll share those photos so you can see exactly what we're talking about here. Uh, let me see if I've got this. And this is in the form of an email, which you'll be able to see. Um, so if you can see my screen right here, it's this area. That is, again, just from knowledge, I know it's a, it's a, a wetlands. And so that's where the conversation with Barry came up. You know, right in this area is where there is some water that stands occasionally. Again, I've got some other images. You know, the, the mats would be about, you know, here's the utility pole that they would have to just swing out to get around. And so we envision the swamp mats being kind of in this area. I think Barry talks about them going in one direction and then the other direction. Wagner is going to lay them. And then once those, and I think it's 24 hours maximum, uh, the move starts at eight o'clock next Tuesday. And, uh, you know, this area will be done kind of shortly thereafter. I would expect that on Wednesday, these maps will be up. If you want us to have Aaron out to take a look and to give us some advice of what, if anything, needs to be done, um, you know, we're happy to do that. This gives another perspective of what you're looking at. So, you know, first, it's with our apologies that we're here asking you at this late date, not our style, certainly not Barry's style, asking for some leniency to maybe allow us to, to do this because we've got all these folks lined up to do it. Uh, and if it happens in the future, we'll, we'll push the building mover, you know, much harder to make sure that they know exactly the path they're going. So I'm happy to answer questions. We can uh, stay on the photos, whatever you want to do, but that's what we're asking for. Thanks, Tom. I'll go to Commissioner Comments. Alex, you had your hand up. Yeah, could you clarify what um, what the action is that we are being asked to take, Aaron? Yeah, so they're they're just putting down timber mats. No, um, I know, but what 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 are you asking us to do? Well, it's it's mostly to make sure that to check with you to see if you have a problem with what they're proposing to do. Um, to put the timber mats down for a day or two to get over this area and then remove them and seed it down. And that can be taken. Okay, so there's so nothing formal in front of us. Yeah, right. I got it. It's just a a motion. Jason. Thank you. Um, I, I have a question for Tom before I. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I assume, Tom, that all the roads will be closed. Yeah, I don't I don't know that they're closed. I think what happens is and, and Barry's probably in the audience could give a little bit more color if I can't. But, you know, you see there's actually Verizon trucks out there right now. They've been prepping. What they do is they add enough line to all the utility poles so that as the uh, truck with the house approaches, they can drop the lines, plank them, and then the structure goes over them. I think they'll have a police escort, Route 9, Belchertown Road's wide enough where I don't think traffic should be inhibited. Um, so I don't, I don't expect it to be closed at that point. Thank you. Jason. Thank you. Um, Tom, can you just give us on this photo show exact? are they staying to the right of these rocks? They're, they're just going to cut that little corner there? Yeah, or? they're going to remove these rocks. Um, and it's probably, you know, in this, I'll show in this photo, you'll see there's those three. Um, yeah, this is a better one. You see where those three cones are. I think these stones come out and it's probably to that third cone that they end up stacking the mats just to give them a wide enough berth to get around specifically this pole right here. All right, so where is the wetland in this area then, Aaron? <laughs> I think it's dry. It's a great right? question. <laughs> it's it's really hard to see actually, Jason, um, in these photos because it looks like it's 
it's like recently been mowed or maybe it, this was taken in the fall when like things are starting to die off. But in that very corner, um, kind of just below where the pole is, there's a there's a wet pocket there. And mm -hmm. frequently, if you see them mowing in the summer, that area will be vegetated because they can't even get a mower into it because it's soft there. So it's a very, very small, isolated pocket, basically, of hydric soils. And there's some um, hydrophytic vegetation that establishes in that corner when the mowing doesn't happen. So it's, yeah. Um, yeah. And there's a wetland across the street. So that's probably where this hydrology is kind of sourced so there's a lot of high groundwater across the street and so it it uh it, through groundwater sort of comes to the surface a little bit there and just for the for the commission like i don't i mean this is such a temporary situation with the mats being there for two days that you know it's even even to go through the process of permitting something like this is really i think borderline overkill um it's, I feel like it's, it's a pretty minor, um, and I would certainly be happy to go out and take a look at it when the mats come out to make sure that it's seeded and, and that there's mulch put down and that there's no impact here. Um, all right. So let's just, for the sake of this picture, like the bumper of the back of that white vehicle would be like the limit of its extents. I would, so yeah. I would Can think you, so. I mean, they're going to need enough. Obviously, there's a grade change here as well. So they're just going to have to lay those mats sufficient to allow the vehicle with the house to get up and then make that turn. But I think you're probably, yeah, you're probably looking at something like that. Okay. So in the picture above, I mean, can they, or I guess maybe, yeah, this picture. Yeah. Is it better? Would it potentially be better for them to go to the left side of that tree? It looks like that grade has a lot less incline on the left side of that tree than it does where, and then they would be out of the wetland and it would be not in front of us. Right. Yeah. And I think, you know, fortunately, maybe unfortunately we're deferring it's pain building movers. Barry's moved. I want to say like three, maybe the last four or two of the last three houses with them. And this is the path that they obviously, you know, depending upon what the board says, uh, and Barry can correct me, but this is the path that that they thought was the most viable with those swamp mats. And like I said, if Barry has another comment to make, by all means, you can bring him in to to make it. But your point's well taken, Jason. Yeah, they're going to have to pile multiple mats on top of one another to be able to facilitate that change in grade. Yeah. So if they go out to the left, it looks like it's a less extreme grade change and then would avoid the wetland. And I guess the maybe my comment would be the house is probably pretty heavy. Um, mm -hmm. And I just don't know what sort of prep they would have to do to this area. You know, for here, they're going to be on this for most of it. And then if they've just got to kind of do make this maneuver here and it's, mm -hmm. you know, they're still staying on to get across. I think it's probably, you know, all things equal, less environmentally intensive to just put these mats down, get across them and re-veg those versus I don't think anybody wants a house stuck because the vehicles sunk into whatever the, you know. Yeah, I think that there's a, it's fortunate for them that it's been very, very dry and it appears that it's going to be dry. So I don't think all that stuff will be too, too wet. But, you know, that was, that's my next comment is they're going to seed and mulch is there a plan to set up irrigation to try to get that seed to pop and germinate quickly? We're coming to the end of the seeding. If they're moving it on Thursday, right? That's the 31st. Tuesday, yeah, so Tuesday the 29th. So then Wednesday oh, the 30th. I mean, not that the days will matter. For what it's worth, I think it's going to be a pretty nice Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday next week with higher during the day, lower at night. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, I mean, and it's one of those things where we can revisit it, you know, let's say in, I, I don't think there's much like, you know, again, I'm a lawyer, so what do I know? But like erosion or other uh, issues that could happen in this area for like scouring, et cetera. And so we can always put it down, 
watch it, make sure it it catches. If not, you know, revisit it in the spring. But I think straw and you know maybe some you know, mix of perennial and annual. Maybe again a little outside of my probably well outside of my comfort zone, but um, you know something like that in that area. Yeah, yeah, because I see the tire right on the side of the driveway there, and that leads me to believe that that whole area is wet. The there's a big basin there for Colonial Village, just to the south or the east of this right yep. so that area holds water you know the basin takes water whether or not it holds it right if it infiltrates into the ground then i would expect that to contribute to some of this potentially so i just don't want to see a bunch of math get piled up you're going to have to put several to get up that grade break take like you said a very heavy house across it and then end up with a bunch of tire ruts or uniform ruts you know, the size of the, the timber matting, and then it's going to get left over the, potentially over the winter. Then in the springtime, we're going to have a bunch of peaks and valleys in this wetland. Yeah, we can definitely, I mean, if Erin wants to come out, you know, I'll call on Barry's reputation a little bit. If she says, this is what you need to do, he's going to do it. I mean, I think it's it's one of those. And one of the other things that, that Barry had said about going this further out is, these wires have not been prepped uh, towards this end. So, mm -hmm. again, it's that whole coordination piece. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. Well, those are my comments and my concerns. Thank you. Thanks, Andre. Um, I mean, Jason, go ahead, Andre. Yeah, just wanted to say that uh, I see that there uh, that with the uh, right matting for twenty four hours uh, placed there um, while you move the house is going to be a minimal impact, and you are going to make sure that uh, you're going to double check back uh, um, with Aaron after the season to make sure that the, uh, any replanting or revegetation is, uh, catching properly. I don't have a problem approving this, uh, if there is an approval to make. Thank you. Thanks, Andre. Um, I still see hands up because I'm trying to move this more quickly. Um, I personally don't have a problem with this. And I guess, as you said, Tom, like we would just appreciate some due diligence in the future. And if we do grant this tonight, that, you know, we're acknowledging it's an acceptance and that we may not be as lenient in the future. Uh, still seeing hands up. Uh, I'm going to go to Aaron. Go ahead, Aaron. I was just going to say if, um, Tom, if, if um, seed and mulch isn't doing it, if you would commit to like a biodegradable um, uh, erosion control blanket or um, something like that, if, additional measures are needed you're willing to work with us to come up with something that's adequate there absolutely okay alex yeah i just want to say a couple of things one i appreciate uh the jam that they're in and um i don't think this rises to the level of having had to put it on the agenda for the public to know that we're talking about it so given that um, the other comment I has is that the functions and values of the wetland affected are pretty minimal. So I think the impacts are going to be minimal. And uh, given that we have a hearing coming up pretty soon, um, I would move that we try and wrap this up pretty quickly. Sure. And maybe add to whoever is making this motion that the Area will be um, seeded and mulched and regrown to the commission's satisfaction, which just is a condition of it. Okay, with that, looking for a motion. Alex, did you have a? No, I'm trying to put my hand down. Okay, well, perhaps you could go ahead with the motion. I move that we approve the matting placement in the subject wetland for a day more if entirely necessary and that whatever cleanup is necessary be worked out informally with Erin to her satisfaction. If somebody can. Second. All right, Alex on the motion, Andre on the second, Rachel. 
Rachel's an I. Bruce, also an I. Guys, I think you do have to have your mic on. It might be I... central. Thank you. <laughs> Jason. Hi. Alex. Hi. Andre. I with a thumbs up. <laughs> okay, and that's an a I. verbal I. Sorry. Okay. You got it. And I'm an I. Okay. Good luck out there, Tom. Thank you very much. We really appreciate it. Yep. Have a good night. I hope Thank I have reason to drive by so I can see this. I think Tom is staying in the room um, oh, okay. for the upcoming Damn. hearing. Hang so on, I'll just Tom. leave him in for the. <clears throat> All right. So are we on our 7.30 notice of intent? Yes. All right. This is uh, this hearing is being held as required by the provisions of Chapter 131, Section 40 of the General Laws of the Commonwealth and Act Relative to the Protection of the Wetlands as most recently amended in Article 3.31, Wetlands Protection under the Town of Amherst General Bylaws. This is a notice of intent for Gard Goddard Consulting LLC on behalf of U-Drive Amity LLC for the demolition of two existing structures and associated infrastructure and construction of a proposed mixed use development consisting of two buildings with associated parking, landscaping and stormwater improvements at 25 to 35 University Drive and 420, 422 Amity Street, map 13B, lots 18, 27, 28 and 54. And I see everybody has been pulled in. Erin, can you um, promote Neve too? I think she's on somewhere. Yes, if there's anybody else, raise your hand. Barry and Phil Henry, if you want to bring them in, I don't know. I know we're going to continue this, so I know there's not a ton, but in case there's questions, it may be useful. All right. Hi, everyone. Hi. Um, I am going to share my screen really quick, if that's all right. Hold on. Yeah, we're going to go to Aaron first for five minutes from staff. Thanks. Thank you. Um. So I issued a memo um, pretty late, the, uh, or well, I guess it was late in the day today, really for me, for my typical comments. Um, uh, I'm not going to go over the content of my memo because I think everybody can take a quick look at it, but um, just generally there was some DEP comments on this one. Um, there, you know, maybe a couple additional adjustments needed um, to accommodate those DEP comments. Um, there's just a couple um, sort of housekeeping things with the um, O&M plan. Um, so yeah, just take a look at my comments, but I'll, I'll yield the rest of my time to um, the application and questions because I think my comments are pretty straightforward. Sure, Erin, just for commissioners and the public, can you summarize your comments in like one minute or the history of the comments, the DE comments? Just to give us some comment context. Um, yeah. Sh sure. So um, the content of the DEP comments was so the site is a is a redevelopment site. So preface with that, um, we have existing structures on the site, existing um, pavement on the site, and existing stormwater systems on the site. There was systems on the site that were existing prior to the construction of the existing development, and there were stormwater systems on the site that were constructed as part of the existing system. Um, the proposal um, is going to be somewhat retrofitting some of the existing stormwater on the site. And that's a little bit complicated because the stormwater system is so old on the site that it has um, adapted some wetland characteristics and also it, there's a high groundwater table on the site. So, um, the, uh, and so some of the comments were pertaining to test pits as far as making sure we know where the groundwater table is existing on the site. Um, and also for TSS, um, those were some of the, the ones that stood out for me um, that our, our TSS uh, calculations are adding up. Um, and I think that there are uh, strategies that, and we talked about this in the field um, and offline, um, some strategies that they could come up with to um, adapt the plan to to comply um, and to kind of get the information that the DEP comments um, mentioned. Um, so that's just a quick overview. Thanks, Sarah. All right, I will hand it back over to you guys. Sam, do you want to share your screen now? Yeah. Yes. Why, why don't I give a little bit of high level just sure. project, and then we can talk wetlands. Um, 
For the record, Tom Reedy, attorney with Bacon Wilson uh, out of Amherst here on behalf of you, Drive Amity. So I think most folks are familiar. I'll share my screen a couple of times first just to orient everyone with the site so that we know what we're talking about. It's at the corner of University Drive, which runs in a north-south direction. Amity Street, west to east, turns into Rocky Hill Road, not so far from the property line right here. This is 422 Amity. This is 2535 University Drive. And then these two parcels, which are you know, as you'll see from Neve's uh, delineation, wetlands, uh, they're not being touched. Um, what they're doing is really functioning as providing the way that zoning works is for additional lot area per family, you need to have a certain area that acts as the denominator. These are being included in the entirety of this project, but they're not being touched. Um, I'll then just now just show the plan from a high level so that folks are able to see it. Um, a little bit about process. We've been through the Zoning Board of Appeals. We've received the variance to allow some additional density in this area. Uh, we're in the planning board process right now. The use is allowed by right. Uh, the planning board wanted to get a sense of what the CONCOM was going to say. This is uh, for the NOI, both the delineation and uh, for the redevelopment. So we're asking for both of those things. Um, you'll see like in, in the plan where the wetland delineation is. And I think in the field you'd see and, and even Aaron schlepped through the, the wilderness, it seems like a pretty um, um, stark delineation from you know where it exists to where the development's going to exist. This is probably a good um, photo to look at here if you can see it, because it shows this roundabout which uh, we participated in let, writing a letter of support for a mass works grant for the town for the hopeful roundabout in this area. You've got two buildings, a northerly building and then a southerly building. Um, you've got parking internal to these structures and then also internal to the site. Uh, this is designed in accordance with what the planning board working through their overlay district uh, is asking for. Uh, somewhat high level because you know we're going to respond. We'll talk to Erin offline to to come up with some of those solutions that she talked about with TSS, and we can figure out what we're going to do for any infiltration or recharge uh, for the site. But somewhat high level, it's a 5.3 acre site, but 231,000 square feet. Uh, we're increasing the impervious area by 9,000 square feet. So from what's existing, that's I would say all that's increasing in this redevelopment. And we're increasing buffer zone disturbance by again 9,000 square feet. Um, we're looking to reuse, and I'll scroll down just so you can see. There's an existing basin in this area that that Aaron had mentioned. If you go there, it's a little grown in, but we're looking to reuse that. Um, I will go through to the grading and drainage plan. We're looking to reuse that basin with some modified grading, and then to expand that basin. Um, along this back area here. You've got uh, pretreatment in the form of a hydrodynamic separator. And while we are increasing the total impervious area, uh, what we're doing is reducing by, I think, 17,000 square feet, the non-rooftop impervious area. So we've got some cleaner, so water quality, we think is is benefited because we're, we're increasing the amount of um, really rooftop, so that clean runoff. Um, and we are, we, we've got catch basins uh, and then that hydrodynamic separator. And then we've got somewhat a natural, I think as, as Rachel had said on the site visit, a natural level spreader on the westerly side of this project. If we were to zoom out from the whole project and you kept going west, that's wetlands. This area takes uh, the drainage from the center of town, right? So from South Pleasant Street, North Pleasant Street, down Amity Street, this is where it all flows. It used to be a, a farmland, and now it's really all turned to the west of it, to wetlands. Um, I can go into more detail. I'll stop there. We can talk about delineation, knowing that that will be back. And so, uh, Neve, I'll yield it actually, to you. Oh, so, Tom, you could actually, if you leave your share up, this is perfect right here. Okay, great. I, I can just talk to this, yeah. Um, right. I don't even know why you're hiring me, Tom. You just do all, you do good enough talking. I don't, I don't need to say anything. Um, yeah, so I mean, we looked at the delineation. Um, you know, we 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 tweaked a couple flags in the field. Nothing major. To, on the northern part, you can see some of that kind of like zigzaggy line where you know it goes up and down. We kind of just smoothed it out to make it you know 
more continuous, but it doesn't really change what the buffer zone is on the site. So we just kind of refined a little bit. That'll be on a, on a, the next iteration of the plan. Um, so that's all BBW in the back there, and then on the south side of the of the project, you know, between this site and the and the um, that well, I forget what that that's that project is. That, you know, whatever that cutout is right over there. Yeah, I don't know what that building is over there, but you know, that's marijuana. All, that's all, yeah, that's another one. <laughs> so it's another, you know, it's all wetland in there. Like Tom was saying, it takes all the drainage and it kind of comes through that area and kind of moves over towards 116. Um, there is a, we called it a, a local wetland on the Amity Street side. It's more of a stormwater swale, but under the under the bylaw, it would be regulated in town. Um, it's, you know, it's got vegetation in it now because it really hasn't been maintained in, in a more recent years, but it's really meant to just be a, you know, roadside swale and it's kind of started to vegetate in and the culvert's buried and it's in really, really poor shape. Um, we're leaving it there. We're going to do some enhancements to it as part of the project. You know, it is, you know, a naturalized wetland system. Um, you know, we're going to shift the driveway over a little bit and kind of expose some of that area that is piped and, and make that part of the swale a little bit longer. There's, you know, rest of, there's planting plans that kind of show wetland planting getting put back along the edges of this area that kind of enhance the buffer zone and enhance the wetland you know, a little bit more than what's there right now. You know, there's no effect to any of the wet, the natural wetlands, you know, the state wetlands to the south and to the um, west of the site. You know, we're staying pretty much outside of 50 foot from, from those areas, um, other than some minor regrading, but all the pavements outside of that. You know, the building will be fairly close to the swale, right there right where Tom's pointing. So that that's going to have you know, the edge of the building is going to be you know closer to the edge of the road. We did look at potentially taking that swale and opening it up way f a lot farther back, but the pipe is buried pretty deep in that invert elevation. If we were to kind of daylight that pipe closer to where the uh, the new entrance is going to be near the roundabout, you know, there'd be a six or seven foot cut that would have to get made to make the hydrology work. And you'd pretty much just have a straight vertical concrete walls down to a swale at the bottom, which, you know, kind of defeats the purpose of making this nice natural like stream, which was, I think, the original thought that we had. So we're just going to try to enhance what's there as, as part of kind of a little like an enhancement package for the for the prop for the project. Um, and, and like uh, Aaron and Tom said, we're re kind of repurposing the existing stormwater that was out there and permitted and designed and, you know, trying to reuse that as, as best that we can because it's already there and it's already functioning and you know it's kind of converted a lot you know it's not formal wetland but it's got wetland vegetation growing in it and if you look at it quickly it looks like a wetland um and there's some small tweaks to the plan we're gonna make based on the field walk today there's a large willow on the western side of the site which i think probably comes out just inside the limit of work if you if you survey located it but we'll try to tweak the grading to you know, save that one large tree that's over there. Um, but yeah, for for wetlands, it's kind of kind of it. It's it's essentially a buffer zone project and redoing the the roadside swale area, trying to make that a a better wetland, a local wetland in the end. Um, yeah, and that what just so um, there's a catch basin right here that's piped, and it, if you went out there now, it yeah. daylights about in this area. That catch basin. If you follow it up through the GIS system, catches all of the the runoff on Amity Street and all the side streets to Amity Street drain in, into that uh, the pipe, which discharges down here. So that's how this. And if you drive by now, it's got the cat of nine tails in it. That uh, is how it was created. And so, you know, looking to uh, keep it piped, daylight it here, and then culvert it again as we get under and then it discharges into Hadley and if you go along Rocky Hill Road in Hadley there's a swale uh probably natural and somewhat carved by the water that leads to the rest of the wetlands yeah, so I mean, you could definitely tell a swale once you get into Hadley is dug out routinely it's more you know excise you could tell it's scooped out with an excavator to kind of just keep it keep it clean and have positive drainage and then just one last uh, image to show you is is the vegetation mitigation plan. So we've got about, I think it's 3.25 to 1, 3 to 1 uh, mitigation for disturbance. I think it's 9,000 square feet of increased existing disturbance, and we've got about 30,000 square feet of, of proposed mitigation that you see kind of in this plan. 
we'll be back with some, you know, Phil and I even talked today about maybe doing some infiltration over in this area, depending upon what the soils show for some recharge to hit the, the recharge yeah. stormwater standard. But this gives you a sense of what we're talking about for the level of reveg that we'd be looking to put in here. So I know it's a lot to throw out at everybody, but um, we want to be respectful of time. So questions, we're happy to answer them, but we know we'll be back. Hopefully, I, I think realistically, um, first December meeting, because I don't know that you're going to meet last of November. If there's a second November, we're happy to come to that one. But if not, first of December would be terrific. So thank you. Thanks, Tom. Um, thanks, Steve. Okay, I have Commissioner, hands up. Um, I, I didn't see who went up first. I'm just going to go from the top. Bruce? So I have a question and a uh, comment based on being at the site visit. Um, with regard to the site visit, the thing that I came away with was a lot of the positive virtues that are being described are dependent on long-term ongoing maintenance. Some of the problems that are there now are because the maintenance wasn't done, not by this owner, but just over time, there was the maintenance wasn't done. And so going forward with this project, I wonder if there's some way that the, the applicant, the owner can come back to the commission, say every five years to demonstrate that the maintenance has occurred. So that's just a thought. The other is about the DEP letter, uh, the file number letter on, on point number five. Why is it TSS removal from the state of New Jersey that is cited or is that a typo? No, if, if I could, just a quick response there. So Phil Henry, our engineer, cited the, a hydrodynamic separator, which, and Phil, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't know that Massachusetts has the data on it. And so we had, he had suggested that New Jersey had the data and that's right. what Mark Stinson was asking for was that information. And we had sent that over to Aaron. All right, thank you. Thanks, Bruce. I want to put a pin in that comment about the maintenance scheduling. Um, go ahead, Jason. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Tom, did you say that there's parking inside the buildings or were you along yeah. with this extra parking lot in the interior between the buildings? No. So in here, there's 40 covered spaces and then I think 32 spaces. You see this like dashed line in this rectangle. There's going to be uh, interior parking in those areas on the first floor. So You've got 42 plus 36 units, uh, 78 units, and then how many parking spots underneath? Yeah, so there's, there's in, in this iteration, I think there's 85 units. In the six-story iteration, I think there's 111 units. And I want to say there's 186 parking spaces altogether between surface and covered. Given that there's some increased uh, buffer zone impact, is there potential to remove those parking spots at the uh was it the north end if this is north just the north side remove those and pull some of that impact away from there yeah it's great Are you being required to have all of these uh surface parking spots yeah it's it's a little bit of a couple of things so one these are proposed to be pervious for what that's worth um, and so we're not saying impervious, we would go through and have O&M associated with these being permeable uh, parking spots. You know, for a, for a project like this and the investment that it takes and us really the risk associated with it, um, having it under parked and then potentially underutilized is a, is a great risk. And so I think I'll speak for Barry, what he tried to do was, was balance the minimal amount of parking he's going to need for a project like this with the environmental factors. And that's why we were putting pervious here because we thought being so close, it makes sense to at least be more environmentally sensitive. So it's not a direct, like we actually need more parking, frankly, like under the bylaw, we need two per uh, unit plus this is mixed use. So there's commercial space, on the first floor of this building and commercial space on the first floor of this building. And so what we're doing, like if you gave every use it's due, 
I, you know, I, I can look at it. I think you need like 200 and uh, 213 spaces. And that's at the 85 unit version. You add another, pick a number of units, you need much more. So this is really like probably the limit of where the, the, the comfort level is finding that balance. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and so I understand that I, uh, I'm not on the zoning board, so I, I, I won't go into my thoughts too much about that. But uh, in the middle there, there's a pollinator meadow area seed uh, with a catch basin in it. And I saw there's only 77% TSS removal. I know there was a comment about the DEP letter. Is that catch basin... Is that is that area designed to be a like a biofiltration swale or biofiltration, or is that strictly seeded and that catch basin is only catching water that falls on that particular triangular island? Yeah, it's a great question. So at this time, it's it's not, but you know, I mean, in full disclosure, we had the site visit yesterday. Aaron raised a couple of good points. I went back. Phil and I had a long conversation today, and and we said. Let's see what the commission is saying, and then we can react. And so if, you know, the, the TSS is something, we can look at this, we can look in these areas to see if there are additional um, maneuvers we can do in order to get that TSS. You know, I think the redevelopment standard is make it better than before, you know, improve it. I don't know that we need to reach the 80% and Phil can, or you can all correct me if I'm wrong, but um, I think you know, that said, I think we're looking to make the site as good as we can. So if you've got a suggestion of, you know, making this something else, we talked about bio retention in here, maybe something like that, that works. But I think right now, and Phil, correct me, but this is just the catch basin to catch this and then pipe it, um, you know, ultimately through the drainage over here to the hydrodynamic separator and then into this detention basin. Yeah, yeah I would love correct. to see that island along with the associated parking spots around it being pervious uh curb, you know that that would be great from my just personal standpoint i think that would go a long way to help but not that we can necessarily dictate that to you thank you thanks jason okay. um so I'm going to weigh in a little bit here. So I just want to remind the commission, um, we are up to the 30 foot buffer. So we're within the 50 foot no build. It is a redevelopment, but there is an increase in building footprint. Um, so we are looking to mitigation um, and how much mitigation we are asking is up to the commission just for some context, um, some recent projects that we've done were four to one and in other cases, you know, in the tens to one. Um, from my perspective, I would not consider the median of a parking lot to be mitigation. So I would like you to excerpt that from your mitigation calculations. That is pretty much um, a case in point of an isolated, non-functional kind of habitat. I mean, it's it's great that you're doing it, and I don't want you to scratch what you're doing, but I think from the... Um, the ledger of what we're impacting and what we're replacing that doesn't really count as any kind of habitat or wetland mitigation. Um, I'm curious about what the trees are that you're planning for here because there's going to be a lot of salt, there's going to be a lot of heat stress, there's going to be a lot of like um, uh, pavement island heat stress going on and what kind of native trees you're planning. Okay, I see you have that up there. So I am not an expert in looking climate forward 30 years from now, what's going to do great on an island in the middle of a parking lot in South Amherst or basically low lying Amherst, but I'm not sure. I think it would be worth looking at those specific ones, especially for the median. Um, so Tom, I know that you said that, okay, I think you said you're doing 9,000 mitigation with 30,000 impacts. So I think it would be great in our next meeting to see like sort of a breakdown of the buffer zone alterations versus the mitigation um, proposal for this. So, you know, it looks, it looks, it looks pretty good. I like what you're, the details that you have here. I just think that like not, you know, what Jason was talking about pervious and um, stormwater 
management for that island is great, but I don't really consider it to be wetland mitigation. Um, other people can weigh in on that. Jason, I see your hand up still. Are you, is it remnant? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Would you consider, one of the other questions I had was that existing wetland on the Amity Street side, if there were enhancements done there, would you consider that to be mitigation or is that just enhancements to existing? Can you mitigate existing or do you have yeah, to- Yeah, that's a good question. And I think mitigate. that comes back to what Bruce's comment was, is that we would also probably like to see some of a long-term plan. So not just like a three-year sign off on the permit, but something that's going to ensure to us that that, um, if you're gonna propose some like ecological lift for that wetland strip, that it's going to be um, life of the project. Um, so that would probably entail some invasive management, you know, salt from the road management, whatever it's going to take to maintain the conditions that you are proposing here in the long term. If any commissioners have any comments on whether or not they would consider that or not consider that to be mitigation, please go ahead. Um, I'd also like to just tell the public that we'll take public comment on this. So while we're discussing it, please raise your hand. Jason, do you have a follow up? Yeah, just what I'm just curious what other enhancements and that doesn't necessarily need to be answered tonight but if that culvert takes drainage from all of Amity Street all of that's a huge watershed going to that small swale but this project potentially affords some opportunities to increase water quality coming off of that big watershed by doing some enhancements to this and what potential enhancements could be done to have a positive effect on all of that water quality as it comes through this culvert. Excellent. That's a great question. Yeah. Do you have any suggestions? I mean, I think some of it is probably like biofiltration. Um, Steve probably has some comments on this. And I, I just want to add in, like, because we're possibly removing that median strip, like I understand there may be like a drive through pervious section to this. And is, is there a planned business for that? Does that need to be there? Um, is there a way to, because it is on the south side. And, and when I'm thinking about mitigation, I'm thinking about connectivity. So if it can be connected to the boundaries and the perimeter of this existing wetland and the proposed mitigation, that's all the better. So we don't like to see isolation when we're talking about mitigation. Go ahead, Bruce. Alex was me for me. Sorry, yes. I can't even see Alex. Go ahead, Alex. Um, Barry has other properties around town, and I wonder if he might be interested in, um, in addition to what we're talking about, an off-site mitigation proposal. Yep. Good question. Um, we don't have to answer that tonight, but um, maybe it could be taken into account um, with all the other comments going on. Bruce, do you want to? Yeah, go ahead and... uh, I guess I'm not sure how this plays out, but remember that all of this water that we've been describing, we are sending it to Hadley. And I think we need to keep our neighbor in mind. I don't know what we do about that, but, but at least we should could discuss it with the Conservation Commission over there and just say, we're trying our best to not send you egregious amounts of stormwater. Yeah, um, I'm not, I don't think that we've encountered that direct um, hydrological connection before. Um, Aaron, do you have any comments about the interface with another town? I mean, this is an existing um, condition <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, but I think all of the comments that have been made relative to enhancing, improving that that swale, which is essentially functioning as a stream. Um, I mean, I've I have been by there probably since since Tom and I started talking about this project, I've probably been by there 30 times. And every time I look at it and it's flowing like a stream through there, um, so whether it's rained in the last 10 days or not. I mean, we were just there. It, we haven't had much rain in the last, you know, eight to 10 weeks and it is it is inundated. Um, so um, I I've 
part of my guidance to the applicant in reviewing this multiple times in advance of this filing was suggesting enhancement of that swale, cleaning it, regular maintenance of it, and also um, providing uh, some some level of um, management of it, but also, you know, that, that it have some plantings and, you know, some sort of um, bio component like vegetation in it to, to provide some, some benefit. Um, you know, one of my comments was about the culvert. Um, there's a culvert between that swale and the, the wetland to the west. Um, the proposal, I believe, was for a 24 inch culvert and the existing culvert is 30 inches. And so my strong guidance out in the field when I discovered that was we need to open this up and make it bigger because part of what that <laughs> undersized culvert is doing is damming up the water um, that's coming through and uh, the more it can flow freely, the more um, you know, the less wet that strip will be and, and it'll it'll serve better function and not um, create damage, like stormwater damage in the future if we get big storms. Um, but relative to the flow of water, I mean, it's it's impossible for us to it, <laughs> stop water flowing between town boundaries, similar to property lines. I think we do our best to um, make sure we're not dumping property onto an, uh, excuse me, dumping water onto a neighboring property, but um, water flows downhill. So, um, that area that is to the west is a is a very large wetland system. Um, there's actually a, um, some type of a, a wildlife reserve back there. So um, I'm not um, I'm not super concerned as far as um, mechanisms to prevent that water from moving where it's wanting to go and where it has been moving for decades. Okay, so it's not a big change from existing conditions is, is there sort of the root of that there. Go ahead, Rachel. Yeah, I, I just want to say it's, it's nice to see a project redeveloped. Um, you know, this isn't a, it's one thing we talked about on the site visit. This isn't a green site. This is a site that's underutilized today. So it's nice to see it being activated. And I think one of the challenges of this project is that we're trying to tie into existing stormwater infrastructure that was installed under different standards. Um, so appreciate uh, what the applicant's trying to do here and how they're going to tweak things for that. I did have a question. Um, in the stormwater report, it's clear that you're improving the flows, you know, you're reducing peak flows at, at all the storms, which is great. Um, but the numbers are really high in some time, like 35 CFS, uh, 32 CFS in some cases. And I, I know I looked at the, the area just... If you could look more closely at specific release points and see if we have any place that we need a little bit more armoring uh, to prevent erosion at those outlet points. So that might be um, at the culvert at the you know at the boundary on the west, or even the outlet control structure that's there now. You know how you're using that. If we need additional armoring or local spreading or something in those areas to make sure that we won't have erosion um, as we have increased rainfall in the future. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Jason? Yeah, I just wanted to ask for a point of clarity. The uh, town line, is that the back of the property? Or no, it's it... probably, if you can see my screen, it's probably somewhere over here. Uh, so there's there's this strip between the end of this property and then where the town line is. So you've got a little bit away. There's, I think there actually is like a, a buried pipe Um in that area that like where it terminates probably is the town line. If and you where to that, and, and then that, that land between the town line and the back of this property line is owned by the town. No, uh, whoever owns the westerly abutting property. Okay. So town line here. And then there's just a different, like if you follow this, there's just a different property owner right in this yep. area yeah. to the town line. And they obviously own over the, at least According to what the GIS shows, and I think the survey shows, I haven't done the total title on that property because it's somewhat immaterial to us. But yeah, it, there's somebody else that owns it, I think, from this across the town line and then beyond the town line. Okay. My last comment is that Alex brought up potential offsite mitigation. Um, is there potential for a partnership with the town 
to, you know, you mentioned seeking funds from a, a, something for the roundabout to potentially improve or um, catch and slow the water coming down Amity Street by using like a green streets, green gutters type of um, BMP system to catch and catch biofiltration and slow the discharge of that water coming down Amity Street into that existing storm drain um, as a potential offsite mitigation. We can talk to Guilford and J I would expect Guilford and Jason would probably be the two folks to talk to at DPW. But yeah, we can certainly have that conversation. Yeah, I don't, I don't know, know if that would that, count as mitigation. Yeah, but I don't think that would count as mitigation as far as we're concerned because the stormwater is DPW purview, but it is a great idea. Um, but it, I'm open to, you know, being uh, creative with the offsite mitigation. So if you guys want to talk to Aaron about all that offline, about things we've done in the past, that'd be great. Um, I just want to summarize the comments, I guess, from the commissioners before we go. And I, I don't see any public comment. So I think uh, Jason commented on like having that median in the parking lot be pervious or having some kind of stormwater treatment. Is that right, Jason? Did I'm summarizing that correctly? That's correct. Just okay. Stormwater um, treatment in the island with pervious parking around. Yeah, and then we had offsite mitigation, and we had long-term maintenance um, to maintain the conditions that are being proposed. We had um, an increase in mitigation or a decrease in the footprint, um, as I would like to um, exclude the median strip. Um, we'd like to confirm that the tree plantings will be resilient to heat and salt stress and will be climate resilient. And as Rachel said, um, just confirming that the release points for the erosion or the release points and the erosion outlet points are um, either where they need to be reduced or um, armored to account for the expected outflows there. Did I miss anything, commissioners? Okay, so I think that summarizes some of the things we'd like to talk about next time. Okay, any final comments? Otherwise, I think we're looking to, con oh, Aaron, go ahead. Um, So just in terms of the continuance date, Tom, I had you on for November 13th for the continuation. Um, did you want to continue to the 13th or? Yeah, 13th want... is great. I think okay. we can, uh, I'm talking to you, Phil. I think we can uh, hustle to get what we need. And Aaron, if, you know, if you have time, maybe next week, we can talk about some of these things offline. Yeah, and it's not any pressure for you guys. It's just uh, for us to have a date to continue certain to. Um, yeah, okay, that'd be great. so, um, and you stopped sharing. So now I can share my screen, hopefully. That was the other, the, the next question. Um, let me just bear with me so I can queue up my slide. Well, we're looking for a motion to continue the public hearing to November 13th at 20, 2024 at 7.30 p.m. That moved. Second. I have Andre on the motion, Jason on the second. Rachel? Aye. Bruce? Aye. Thank you, Bruce. Um, Jason? Aye. Andre? Aye. Alex? Aye. Are there any members of the public on? There's no hands raised from the public. And I'm an aye. Okay. Thank you all. Have thank a good night. Thank you very much. And we'll see you, you next time. Thank you. Bye. Okay. All right, next up. Um, so we're opening this one. This is a public here. This public hearing is now called to order. Uh, this hearing is being held as required by the provisions of Chapter 131, Section 40 of the General Laws of the Commonwealth and Act relative to the protection of the wetlands, as most recently amended in Article 3.31, Wetlands Protection on the Town of Amherst Bylaws. This is a Notice of intent for SLR International Corporation on behalf of the town of Amherst for improvements to the Amherst Regional High School track and field facilities and associated site work at 21 Mattoon Street, map 11D, lots 81, 270, and 215. Sure. Okay. Michelle? Yes, Alex? I need to recuse myself from this, so I'm going to 
turn off my camera, which is off, and I'm going to turn off my microphone. I'll be back okay. for the next hearing. Okay, thanks, Alex. Okay, Aaron, so it looks like you're pulling folks in. Hi, Kevin. Hello. Um, anyone else, please raise your hand. Mike. Hello, Mike. All right, we'll go five minutes for staff comment and then we'll go to you guys and we'll let you do your presentation and then we'll do public comment. So um, similar to the last uh, project, I was able to get a couple comments out later this afternoon. Um, <clears throat> just a couple general observations. Um, so I'm not I'm not particularly concerned about stormwater on this site, um, mostly because you know we're not we're not talking about uh, a high TSS situation here, being that it's a um, a field. Um, so uh, one one comment was that you know there will be an irrigation system, and we know we have uh, the flashy tan brook um, system, and so to prevent any impacts of um, additional flooding that may already be happening with the tan, um, that there needs to be some assurance that the irrigation system will be um, not functioning when we're having rainstorms. Um, also the um, during the site visit, it was observed that there was a large amount of um, grass clippings and leaves that are being piled up immediately adjacent to the Tanbrook culvert inlet. Um, and so my recommendation was that there be a different area designated for compost of those types of materials, primarily because that material is washing into the stream um, and, you know, certainly don't want to be clogging up infrastructure with um, landscaping debris. Uh, operation and maintenance plan, uh, I submitted some comments back. Mostly the um, there wasn't a, an actual plan that was tied to the operation and maintenance. Um, and so we need to identify where the stormwater structures are, where the areas of maintenance are um, relative to the operation and maintenance plan. And then the standard um, operation and maintenance log that we use needs to be associated with that. And the unique identifiers should correlate with one another. Um, and, oh, I don't think it's going to be an issue for your TSS, but mostly just for checks and balances to have the TSS removal worksheets um, updated to have the full treatment train um, incorporated on the sheets. Um, that was basically my comments. Um, this, if you look at the plan, this is a buffer zone only project and really barely touching the buffer zone. Um, DEP does not, so the Tanbrook is intermittent in this stretch. Um, we've done extensive, extensive research on the, um, where the Tanbrook turns perennial and it's certainly not perennial until it pops out over um, by, by McClellan Street where it's daylit. Um, so the section that is north of this site is intermittent, which means it has a 100 foot buffer zone and the work that's proposed is barely touching that buffer zone. The, the stream is piped underground in a culvert, um, but under the DEP regulations, once a, um, a stream goes underground for at least 200 feet, it's no longer jurisdictional, which is the case in this instance. So we're talking about a very, very small bit of impact to the buffer zone um, on the northern part of this site. Thanks, Aaron. Kevin or Mike. Um, okay. Dave, yeah. I see your hand up. Did you want to just add some staff comment? Um, not really, Michelle, but thank you. I just wanted to see if um, Aaron could bring Bob Parent. Bob Parent is um, our representative from the town. He's our special capital projects manager. And I just wanted the commission to see him and get to know him. And he, if questions come up that the SLR team can't answer, Bob is here as well. Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Dave. Andre, do you have a logistics question? I have a question and it's um, a quick one. Is that uh, is that proposal for the place where the current where the track currently is and historically has been? Yes, it's a replacement of the track. Thank you. Yep. OK, um, Kevin, Mike, do you want to give us an update from your end, please? Sure, I'll uh, I'll give a broad overview and then pass it off to Mike for more of the technical aspects of the project. Um, let me just share my screen to give some general information. Can everyone see the uh, aerial of the campus? 
We can, thank you. Okay, great. So we're talking about the Amherst Pelham Regional High School campus at 21 Mattoon Street. Uh, the project does entail uh, removal and reconstruction of a new running track. The existing running tracks located on the south side of the property. It is a six lane running track, um, ovals and straightaway. Uh, the proposal is to remove that in its entirety. Um, there's a shop put event area in one D zone, high jump in the other. The long jump and pole vault areas are just outside of it to the east. There is currently a six pole high intensity discharge lighting system. All of what I just mentioned will be removed as part of the project. Uh, this is just our survey uh, showing the area of the, the project. Um, the wetlands that we're talking about, the Tanbrook is delineated in the far northwest corner and the buffer falls just along our project limit lines. The proposal is to uh, reorient the track, uh, build a brand new facility with a north-south preferred orientation. Uh, this helps keep sunlight out of the athlete's eyes. We're proposing to expand the facility from a six lane running track and straightaways to an eight lane, uh, which is more con conducive to running efficient track meets. And also um, if the school decides to do a more higher level competition, uh, you know, regional or multi-school meets. The grass, the field inside the track will be reconstructed, natural grass. Uh, we're calling the field with inside the track a high performance track, a uh, high performance field, as we'll be amending the soils to increase permeability, uh, which will allow for better play. The, the spoils from the construction on, on this facility will be transferred to the grass field area to the west uh, and will be spread out and to create a second multi-purpose grass field. Um, this just this represents this number nine represents just a painted javelin throw area. Um, this is the discus event area, uh, basically in the current location of where it is now. Uh, however, it will be a new discus area and cage. We're showing a softball field footprint. This is not part of the project, but we wanted to uh, during the design process. Uh, show the, the stakeholders that we were saving uh, space for the potential of a future softball facility. This new track and field area will have a four pole LED lighting system. There will be a concrete bleacher pad constructed as part of this project, but um, as the budget currently lies, we're not proposing any new spectator seating at this time. The track will be surrounded by a four foot chain link fence in a uh, new ADA compliant walkway around the entire perimeter. An ADA walkway con connecting to uh, improved sidewalk improvements and uh, pedestrian drop off along the Toon Street and an ADA accessible walkway up to the high school parking lot. With that uh, being the general overview of the proposed improvements, I'll pass it off to Mike uh, Gagnon from our office, our professional engineer. And I believe he'll be sharing his screen. Thank you, Kevin. I hope everybody can hear me okay. Um, I think what I would like to do is just give a brief uh, overview, um, you know, recognizing um, the scope of this project. So I'm just going to share. Um, give me a second. If everybody can see that. So, you know, what I'm going to talk about first and foremost is, um, you know, just uh, bear with me a second here is the wetland delineation um, that we've been talking about. So, again, you know, here's the existing running track and the area um, that was delineated. This is a clip uh, directly from our wetland delineation report. Um, as was mentioned, um, the area of uh, BVW and in Inland Bank um, uh, associated with Tan Brook um, is up here at the inlet uh, to the culvert. Uh, which is in this area here. And just for orientation, this is located behind the existing residences um, that are along um, Chestnut Street. So um, with that, just to kind of give an overview of stormwater management improvements, um, I won't go into a lot of detail, but just kind of describe, um, you know, what's involved as part of this project is, um, 
you know, obviously uh, one of the first tasks that we undertook with this project um, is to assess the condition of the existing Tanbrook culvert. Um, obviously with the investment of this type of a project, we wanted to ensure that the integrity um, of the culvert was sound. We actually did a um, video survey uh, back in January, and it was determined that, you know, the pipe itself uh, throughout the reach uh, within the site is, is in good condition. So, um, that was a good thing. Um, so again, with the orientation of the proposed running track, one of the things that we had had to consider um, is the additional uh, impervious area associated with the additional lanes um, associated with the track, uh, the concrete bleacher pad, and some of the other minor uh, additional impervious areas uh, with the pedestrian improvements. So we have uh, incorporated a stormwater management plan uh, consisting of a subsurface infiltration system located here. And then we have a series of stormwater um, basins around the perimeter of the site um, located here. And really that's to provide um, not only stormwater management, i.e., you know, peak flow, a reduction, but also um, water quality enhancement, uh, particularly with the additional impervious area. Um, we were able to accomplish that um, within the um, stormwater infiltration system, uh, which actually provides both groundwater recharge um, as well as uh, TSS removal. Um, and again, as Aaron had mentioned early on, you know, this site um, is not gonna be a tremendous uh, TSS load, uh, recognizing that, um, you know, there is not, not gonna be any de-icing agents uh, obviously applied to the track during the, during the winter months, um, you know, um, just some other details uh, with this project. We've we've also included a uh, sedimentation erosion control plan um, as shown here, and we're showing the location of the existing stockpile area. Um, obviously, in order to construct the proposed uh, track and, and inner facility, um, the intent is to essentially strip all of the existing topsoil uh, within this area, stockpile it, and that material will essentially be reused uh, once it's amended um, during construction. That that soil will actually be tested, um, you know, uh, for nutrient value, um, and also amended uh, with with sand um, in order to promote um, a degree greater degree of uh, infiltration, um, which is not happening. Uh, with with the current facility. Um, and with that, uh, we're also providing perimeter uh, controls consisting of uh, compost filter to um, all of the existing uh, catch basin inlets within the project uh, area will will get uh, inlet protection. And because this project's going to um, disturb um, essentially greater than one acre, um, we are required to file um, with under the uh, construction stormwater general permit um, with EPA. And again, that will be uh, um, filed um, by the prospective contractor. Thanks, so, Mike. Um, I'm going to just ask you to, if you're not done, just to wrap up real quick so we can get to yep, commissioners. Yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty much my presentation so great thank you um okay um if there's any public comment please raise your hand now and i'll get to the room um commissioners any questions or comments on this one rachel go ahead yeah and thanks for that presentation and thanks for the site walk um really excited about this project uh one of the things that's nice is that it's orienting the field in a way that's more advantageous for the field of play facing north and south rather than east and west means kids can actually see the ball at sunset. So that's great. Um, I was curious about the field of play, and I mentioned this on site, that the, the sewer manhole has dropped a foot below the field of play, which is great for safety. Um, kids running over it and you know slipping or twisting an ankle. And I'm curious about the subsurface stormwater system and, and that interface with the kids. 
uh, it looks like there's some manholes that are in areas where the, they might be running past and, and it could be a safety thing. So if those could be dropped, um, and also if there are any ports for inspection of the subsurface system, if if those, you know, what that interfaces with the surface of the track material, with the field material, and is there, and also have you looked at maybe another configuration where you shift it so that those um, access ways and area ways could actually be in the concrete and, and not in conflict with the field of play? That was a question. Um, also, I was curious, I know you're not really touching the parking lot except for the new accessible walkway, which is great for access, um, but wondering if you might consider working with the shade tree committee or, or the tree warden to look at shade trees along that slope. Um, to help reduce the heat impact of the stormwater coming off of, of that parking lot area. Um, and then I'm thinking about um, with accessible spaces, and this is outside CONSCOM jurisdiction, maybe thinking about restriping the accessible spaces um, to align with that new lower walk. Um, I know right now they're sort of at the intersection of the parking lot, and it'd be great if the parallel ADA spaces are closer to that lower section for ease of access. Uh, well, I'll address that last uh, point that you made, and I did not mention that just because of the brevity of the presentation, but we are going to restripe that western side of the parking lot, and we're going to provide two new accessible spaces in the northwest corner closest to that slope down to the, uh, the track and field facility. So um, we'll accommodate one standard accessible parking spot and one ban accessible spot, and then there'll be a new drop ramp that will allow um, an accessible access down uh, a 4% uh, pathway down to the new track and field facility. Cool. And I can, Mike can address the cover on the, uh, the structures that we're showing. Uh, those would be buried below the topsoil level and they would have a uh, magnetic uh, or metallic marker on them to be easily located, located and dug up if necessary. Because right now I know we have two structures for that infiltration. Um, gallery that are located in the what we liked our preferred overrun area of the field, which is a 15 foot buffer. So in no instance would we have a physical structure uh, in the playing surface or within 15 feet of it. Great. So it sounds like two out of three of Rachel's questions were addressed and then the shade tree one is not exactly our purview, but it is a great comment. So if you, if you. Yeah, we did, we did look at shade trees along that Eastern slope and, and two things prevented us from committing to that. Um, partly that slope is three to one, if not two to one in some locations. And we're putting a walkway along that parking lot. Um, and we saw it was going to be a challenge to get uh, trees in there. Um, also there is a, thought that in the future, um, spectator seating could also go into that slope, which we'll use initially as a natural spectator area. Um, but eventually that would be ideal space for a, a small amount of spectator seating uh, along with an accessible press box. Um, so we didn't want to, um, we didn't see that as a great opportunity. Um, we also thought about shade trees along Mattoon Street, but if you look at a street view or you go out there, um, that's where the overhead wires are serving the school and that that campus area. Um, so it's not the ideal side of the street for significant vegetation, but would be happy to look at other areas within the project site. Um, we just know spa field space is limited and we're we're already taking more than they 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 are already have with this expanded facility. Thanks, Kevin. Bruce. Well, I, I just wanted to ask, uh, at the site visit, Rachel asked a number of what seemed to me as, an, as a novice really good questions about the residences to the west and the linkage of the, the depth of various things in their basements and this and that. And I just wondered if, Rachel, you felt like you got the answers you needed about how the, all this would affect those, those residential properties. Yeah, I, I think it, it's it's. I, I just wanted them to be aware that they weren't showing those footprints in the plans. People typically don't. That's coming above and beyond. But just wanted to be sure that you're aware that there are houses next to where the stormwater basins are. And I had asked them to consider um, any additional uh, protections they might need to do for those adjacent houses um, because they are proposing drainage 
basins in those localized areas. Um, and if, if they needed to consider any subsurface drainage in those basins to make sure that they're not increasing groundwater, um, groundwater flow in those towards those homes. Um, and, you know, we talked a little bit about the distance and things like that, but it, it was something, something mentioned. Thanks, Bruce and Rachel. Kevin, do you want to respond to that now, or is that something we are going to return to? Uh, Mike may have a response right now. <laughs> I I don't. Um, I'm sure that consideration was given. We uh, we do we did test pits out there, and I believe, and Mike, correct me if I'm wrong. Groundwater was found three and a half to four feet down, depending on where we where we dug. Yes, that is correct. Actually, deeper than that. Um, I'm just sharing um, a screen at the moment just to show everybody or the commission on um, the relationship of the stormwater basins with the adjacent properties. And, you know, we did take a look at that, um, you know, based on on the comments that we heard during the site visit. Um, realistically, the closest uh, there's this commercial property here. Um, water quality basin three, that is about 38 feet uh, to the face of this building. And I believe um, this is slab on grade. Um, in terms of residential properties, uh, which are, you know, these three homes up in this area, um, we took a look at the proximity of water quality basin two, um, and that is about 55 feet, close to 60 feet um, from this property here. So, you know, quite a distance. Um, and also keep in mind um, these, these trucks or these basins, um, although they may fill, um, we do provide uh, yard drains uh, within the base of those so that, you know, they will drain out. So they're not going to hold um, a significant amount of water um, over time. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Bob, I saw your hand up. I don't, did you yeah, want to just, add that? I was going to make the last point that Mike made, which okay. there are low level drains in each one of those basins for that purpose so that we can ensure that they don't hold water for any extended period of time. Great, thanks. Bruce, did you want to follow up or do you no. have another comment? Okay, go ahead, Jason. Uh, can you, Bob or Mike, can you clarify the, the depth at which those basins will hold water? I didn't see any details for them in this set of plans. Are they going to be holding a foot of water or two inches of water? Can you just clarify that? If you wouldn't mind starting off, Mike, that would be great. Yeah, absolutely. I'm just sharing again. <laughs> Sorry about that. But um, just to show you an example. So, you know, looking at Basin 3, you know, this one is going to be fairly shallow. One of the things that, you know, we needed to consider with these is, you know, with the possibility of like an errant ball during play, um, you know, we we tried to soft grade these, so to speak, four to five to one slopes, depending on where they were in proximity to the field. And they're not that deep either. So for example, this one um, is only about a foot and a half deep. Um, if we move up to basin two, um, kind of the same thing. This is maybe a foot and a half. Um, likewise, water quality basin one is probably the, the deepest. And this one is you know, most remote uh, with respect to adjacent properties. This one's about um, two and a half feet deep. So that kind of gives you an idea of, of what that is. If that helps. Thanks. So they're meant to, to hold a, a small amount of water that's going to get to them via like overland flow? Correct. Is there concern then about a road? I mean, if they're not, I assume that Again, I didn't see details. Are you having, it doesn't look like there's swales cut in or very well-defined swales necessarily cut in to take water to these basins. So are you, will you have any kind of erosion protection in the long term to prevent these, the slopes from being eroded with that overland flow? I think, Mike, if you want to pull the plan back up, 
we are also taking a significant piece of the water that's coming in is coming in by our piped structures from yard drains on the field area and the perimeter drain on the track. So it, I don't know percentage wise how much of it is overland versus how much of it is piped, but I do know that a significant piece of it originates from a, basically an outlet that comes into the pond area and then again leaves the pond area, if, if I'm correct. It's all pretty flat. <laughs> yep. Okay. Um, I see. All right, some Michelle, I had one last yeah. comment. Go ahead. What are we just meant? We were talking about the adjacent properties. Water quality basin two appears to slope the back of its slopes towards the adjacent properties. Is that correct? Yeah, and there's actually there is a um, wooded buffer or natural swale. <laughs> Um, that runs along the, the property line um, back in that area. So there is a natural depression. And if I may pull that up again, um, sorry to keep jumping here, but I assume this is the area that you're talking about right in here. Correct. I just wanna make sure we're not yeah, so the, it, as you can see, relatively we're, similar yeah, to existing. right, we're grading down 287, and then it stops at 286, um, which is down in this area. And then it does go back up slightly um, to the adjacent parcel. Will we be creating a wetland there? No, because um, as was mentioned, these, these are designed to drain out. Um, you know, per DEP requirements, uh, we have to demonstrate that these will be dewatered uh, within 72 hours. Sorry, not in the basin, but in that 286 there, if that's a low-lying area, <clears throat> is that collecting? It seems like that is a, like a trough there with a swale where that would collect water, and that's not considered a wetland now? Correct. That would That was looked at um by our soil scientists and that was not determined to be a wetland all right okay i'm gonna go to public oh, andre go i'm ahead. sorry real quick uh did you say that was not determined to be a wetland and that it was uh looked at by the soil scientists correct thank you thank you Okay, um, I'm seeing no more hands. I'm gonna to go to public comment. I see Maria Kopicki going to allow you to speak. So we have two minutes for public comment, please. Aaron, I don't have controls apparently. Do you mind giving talk allowance? I think I've got, yeah, oh, I, you guys can I'm hear me. Hi, Maria Kopicki, South Amherst. Um, First, I, I just want to express on behalf of a lot of people that have been following this project for a long time, much appreciation, um, especially that this is going to be a grass field. There are a lot of people that cared very deeply about that, and so I want to appreciate that. Uh, I want to appreciate the commission as well for paying a lot of attention. Um, I, I heard Aaron say that uh, there's not a lot of concerns about stormwater, but as you all know, it, it's really important that we get this project right the first time. So please, whatever you need to do to make sure that that that's all, we're all good here it is appreciated. I did have one question about uh, the wetlands that are up in that northeast corner of the these fields. I realize that that is not directly a part of this project, but there's that other field that's up in the in the northeast, and I'm wondering. Um, would there be any have, in your explorations? Is there any um, any mitigations or, or or any improvements that can be done to help with any with any wetness issues up there? Maybe some native planting. So maybe while you guys are out assessing this as a whole to see if there's anything that can be done to improve at all that the situation up in the northeast corner. I know that it's not a part of this project. It was it's just a question for you um while we're while we're working on the site. Um but much appreciation. Thank you. Thank you. Very excited about this project. 
Thanks, Maria. So I don't think that we're needing to require mitigation for this because they're pretty much outside the buffer there and the flows don't really work towards um, any kind of stormwater um, direction to the northeast corner. But I guess Kevin, Mike, and Bob, you've heard the comment and it is a, a point where this project could maybe have some enhancement to the overall conditions of the of the site and maybe even have some cool interface with the um, students there because I know that they go do things out there for class. So have you looked at it? Has there been any explorations of that and you and you don't have to answer that now but it would um you know add to the benefit of this larger project if you could maybe comment on that at some point um i'm going to go to the next public comment pamela rooney Pamela Rooney, 42 Cottage Street. Uh, thanks for working on this project. I have a couple of questions. Um, one in particular that's because people have raised the concern about uh, water in basements on the west side of east side of Cottage Street. Um, I wonder if if somebody can re reiterate exactly what the treatment will be of construction above the uh, Tanbrook pipe. I understand it's not going to be moved, so therefore it has to be built on top of. Um, so that is of concern. Second question is, are there actual setback requirements from drainage basins from property lines? And I, I do look uh, pretty carefully at the ones that have been discussed tonight, um, just in terms of collecting water as close as possible to the to the perimeter because it gives you more playroom play play field. Um, a, a grading question that came to my attention when I looked at the grading plan is that uh, one of the properties on the east side of the street um, has a very large uh, old silver maple that is probably pretty close to the property line with the school, and I see extremely tight grading being proposed literally wrapping around the corner of that property. And I think that is very, it is way too tight for a tree of, of that size to survive that kind of construction. And I would ask if there's some way that that can be mitigated. Um, let's see. Uh, and last question is just about the, the soils. I looked at the soil test pit uh, results and it looked as though much of that material is brown sandy silt. And I just wonder what the characteristics of that soil is in terms of its permeability. It's being proposed to be used as uh, the material to create a new play field. Um, is, it, is it going to work? Uh, is that field going to be uh, able to drain and, and be usable? Thanks. Thanks, Pamela. So that was a lot of questions. Um, Aaron, do we have a setback for stormwater basins? Do you think you could weigh in on that one jurisdictionally? Um, so for infiltration uh, basins, it's a 50 foot minimum setback, but every BMP has a different setback. Um, but for an infiltration basin, it would be a 50 feet minimum from a wetland. Okay. And so are we meeting that in all cases? Um, for the proposed infiltration basins, yes, they're they're nowhere near the buffer zone. Okay. Um, I think my I think my question was setbacks from property lines, not from other wetlands. Okay. So, yeah. from a from a concom standpoint, there isn't a um, uh, stormwater regulatory stormwater setback from a property line. That I'm aware of. Okay. Um, Kevin, Mike, Bob, per the maple, um, maybe you could be um, more deft in your grading and perhaps give the root system a bit of a leeway when you're out there. Is that something that can be accommodated just to save some shade in a tree? Yeah, I'm seeing I'm seeing a nod from Kevin, so I assume that'll be noted. Yep. Um Let's see what else was there. I think that um, I'm going to rely on the project 
proponents, applicants to hear what else, what has been said and come back because this will be continued tonight and be able to address um, concerns from the abutters and public. Jason. Yeah, I think Pam brought up a good point with this being sandy soils and everything. And, and I believe uh, it was mentioned that the soil is going to be amended. Is, uh, are we concerned or do we have, I, I'm concerned about having to put um, potentially excessive amounts of soil amendments to get uh, to get grass to grow on these? And are we going to be adding soil amendments year after year after year if it's particularly sandy and doesn't hold a lot of organic matter? If we want it to drain, it's not gonna have a whole lot of organic matter. So is that going to be replaced with continuing application of soil amendments? And then what are the potential nutrient impacts downstream? I mean, I just want to point out that this was on the pro and con, you know, list of things for artificial turf versus natural turf. And so here we are with natural turf. And I think that it was um, part of the bigger picture about what the downstream effects would be if we covered that in artificial turf. And I think it was understood that having a natural turf field is going to require amendments and fertilization. So unless you guys know exactly what's going to be required right now and you can tell us, or if that's going to be something that you discover when you do the excavation, I mean, please address it now. If you know, I assume that you'll have to do the testing once you've lifted up the dirt. So the plan currently, again, the field within the natural, uh, within the running track is going to be uh, an enhanced field with uh, sand amendments, uh, probably a 60% sand increase. Uh, because we are dealing with silty soils. Um, the, the remaining soil will be tested for nutrients and organic content. Um, and that material, if we determine, does need some initial treatment just for suitable turf grass growth. Um, the typical process is that material spread and graded, and then the, the amendments are tilled in. They're not significant like that sand amendment that's going in the primary field. Um, after that, we've discussed with the uh, the school and uh, about um, doing in situ testing of the actual field once constructed. And that's really the time to develop your, your uh, site specific operation and maintenance plan. We've also discussed with the, uh, the school about bringing in potentially um, outside uh, contracting to do perform the maintenance. We've done this successfully in other communities. Um, and they do the annual maintenance procedures and sometime in addition to just the uh, periodic mowing that's required during the growing season. So that's that's currently the process that we're uh, we're moving forward with. Thanks, Kevin. <clears throat> okay, seeing no more hands and looking for a motion to continue this public hearing to November thirteenth, twenty twenty four. No, oh, Rachel's hands back up. Go ahead, Rachel. Yeah, I just want to um, thank the public for their comments. Very helpful, and and Jason for your comments in particular, um, and and also just ask the applicant. I'm sure you've talked about this, but the period of establishment and hardening of the field, and when the and making sure that we're Bob. I'm sure you're on top of this too. The schedule and making sure we have time for the field to harden off um, before before students are out there playing. So I'll just I'll address uh, again. The, uh, the, the primary field, the one going within the running track, uh, that will be receiving a new irrigation system. And I know that was mentioned early on. Um, with an irrigation system, we can sod that field. And um, sod can generally root and be playable uh, within a matter of uh, weeks uh, with irrigation. So the goal would be to start construction on this project um, as soon as the school athletics would permit in the uh, end of the spring season. Uh, doing summer construction. Um, typically, a project this size takes about uh, four months from initiation to completion, putting us in the fall 2025 season, um, potentially allowing that field within the track to be used in the fall. Um, the other field, the surrounding ones and the restoration to the west and around the track would be seeded um, and would not be receiving a new irrigation system at this time. However, provisions wouldn't be in place to expand the new irrigation system. Um, that would require at least one full growing season. So we would not anticipate that field being online until at least spring 2026. 
Thanks, Kevin. Um, that's a bit outside of our jurisdiction, so I'll leave that to you guys to figure out how to harden the field. Go ahead, Bruce. I move to continue. Question. I move to continue the public hearing to November thirteenth, twenty twenty four, at seven thirty five p.m. I'll second. Bruce on the motion. Jason on the second. Bruce. Aye. J Rachel. Aye. Jason. Aye. Andre. Hi. Alex, are you still there? Alex is a recuse. I'm an I. Okay. Thank you guys. Thank I'll you. See you on November 13th. Have a good night. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, next up we have Niche Engineering on behalf of Wayfinders Incorporated for the demolition of two existing residential dwellings and constructions of a new proposed residential building with associated site and utility improvements, including parking and stormwater management at 7280 Belchertown Road, map 15C, lots 58, 59, and 60. This is open. Um, it is being continued. If there's public comment, raise your hand quickly. Otherwise, I am looking for a motion to continue this unless, Aaron, you have an update that we should hear right now. Oh, they're just working on revisions, um, particularly invasive species management. Um, so. Okay, thank you. I'm seeing no hands, so I'm looking for a motion to continue. I'll move to continue the public hearing to November 13th, 2024 at 7.40 p.m. Second. Jason on the motion, Alex on the second. Rachel? Aye. Jason? Aye. Bruce? Aye. Alex? Aye. Andre? Aye. I'm an aye. Okay, next up, we have notice of intent for CWD Consultants Incorporated on behalf of University of Massachusetts Building Authority for the construction and expansion of a regional ground source heating exchange system, including geothermal wells at parking lot 31 and underground piping, heat recovery chillers, and associated infrastructure within the existing utility plant, 110 North Service Road, 8A, 8C, lots 46 and 13B. Again, we're looking to continue this. Aaron, is there any... Public comment, um, raise your hand, Aaron, give us an update. Bruce, I see your hand up. <laughs> Aaron, take it away. I do see a member of the public with their hand up, Michelle. Um, I do. I, do you want to just give us like a one minute update, please? Y yes. Um, <clears throat> so there, there are some plan adjustments that are currently being made to address the commission's comments and staff comments from the last hearing. They just didn't have enough time. Um, but there there were some public comments that were received. Um, I put those in your folder, um, and I expect that that's the, the commentary that you're going to hear. Okay. Um, I, hear, I see one public comment, so we're going to let you talk. Please keep it relevant to our purview, which is the wetlands and our jurisdiction. And two minutes, please, and state your name and where you live generally. Thank you. My name is Josna Reggae, and I live um, in District 1 on Farview Way. Um, so I understand uh, that the UMass consultant will be asking for a continuance until your November 13th meeting. So I just want to make a brief comment now, and we'll reserve the rest of our questions and comments until then. The Farview neighborhood um, abuts the proposed site for the geothermal well field consisting of 70 wells, each 800 feet deep, a part of UMass's geothermal heat exchange system. Yesterday, I submitted a letter signed by a number of neighborhood residents with a list of questions to the commission members and the applicant. We learned from Erin only this morning that the purview of the Conservation Commission is limited to the project's potential impact on wetlands and potential water contamination as a result of the drilling and of the ongoing operation, including impacts on the aquifer, groundwater, or surface water. Consequently, um, the questions in our letter that pertain to other kinds of impacts may not be directly admissible here, though we sincerely hope that the applicant will respond to our questions about them. We'll use the time between now and November 13th to refocus our questions to the issues relevant to this commission, Meanwhile, we hope that in preparation for considering the application, the commissioners will ask for the environmental impact statement and feasibility studies for the university's geothermal heat exchange project, 
and the state DEP's best practices for geothermal drilling. We also hope you'll look very carefully at any other studies and reports that have examined the project's potential environmental impacts and determine whether the applicant is proposing to use best practices in order to mitigate them. Thank you very much. That's all for this evening. From Thank us. you. Thank you. We look forward to a uh, pointed um, comments towards our jurisdiction too, so that we may better um, understand the concerns of the abutters. All right, any commissioner comments? Okay, looking for a motion on this. I move to continue the public hearing to November 13th, 2024 at 7.50 p.m. Second. Andre on the motion, Bruce on the second, Rachel. Aye. Jason. Aye. Jason. Andre. Aye. Bruce. Aye. Alex. Aye. And I'm an aye. Okay. Those are our hearings. Now we're on to some other business, um, enforcement compliance. Heard from Aaron that there is no update on Wildflower. Can we just call that a check off and move on? Yes. Okay. Um, we have Hickory Ridge. Um, is that it? Is it just Hickory Ridge? Is there anything else? Um, the We were supposed to be issuing a um, an order of conditions tonight, but we'll be tabling that to the next meeting. So um, this will be our last business item. Okay, so I just want to mention that um, the information and material came in after the Wednesday, uh, which is our deadline for a new material submitted to the commission for consideration at a meeting. So um, hopefully everybody had a chance to review it. Um, and I think Lawrence is here if you want to bring Lawrence in. Um, I understand commissioners went on a site visit, so I'd like to hear from you guys about what you saw. Aaron, do you want to just give us an update about that first, and then we'll we'll move on? Um, yeah, we had a site visit um, uh, last Friday, I believe, um, and it was a, a beautiful day, very dry. Uh, myself, Alex, and Rachel attended. Um, the site looked very stable. Um, and, and Dave actually joined us sort of towards the end of the site walk. A lot of good questions and discussion. Um, and I did, I believe, put photos into the, um, maybe the photos didn't make it in. Um, yeah. And I just will add for the record that we are considering a change to the order of conditions on this, which is to um, give a, uh, remove the phasing criteria, which is, I don't know, three or four orders of conditions so that the uh, building, construction can happen within the month in um, as proposed rather than phasing as planned. Okay, well, you're bringing that up, Erin, I'll go to um, commissioner comments. And if there's any public comment, please raise your hand and I'll get to it. Alex, go ahead. Yeah, there's part of me that doesn't think we should be talking about this. It uh, is a very visible project and was not included on the agenda that was published. So the public did not have forewarning that Hickory Ridge was going to be discussed tonight. And I'm a big proponent of public input, uh, having had a 38 year career with a federal agency that got sued a lot of times for not including the public. Um, and they got the material in late. It wasn't in the agenda that got published. And I, I just don't think we should be talking about it until it is published. Thanks, Alex. Understood. Um, I guess I would just point out that um, at every meeting, we do have other business that gets added in late, which is not on our agenda. So that would be an exception to our general um, procedures, which is to talk about things that aren't on the agenda. So I, the difference here is that it's a more public facing uh, project. Bruce, go ahead. I think the middle ground is let's discuss it very briefly and then make sure that it gets a fuller discussion later where the public has a chance to weigh in. Thanks, Bruce. Um, is there any more commissioner comments on this? Uh, if, yeah, go ahead, Rachel. Yeah, no, the, the site walk was very helpful. Um, it was hard to tell from the photos before kind of what this layout of the site was and what the issues were. 
So that, that was that was really helpful to understand what we were looking at and talking about. Um, also wanted to say I really appreciate Michael's comments um, and his the letter he said it was really clear and it was very respectful and constructive. Um, he had a he had a couple of concerns that were you know that we saw on site too and I think they could be easily resolved. One would be um, he was concerned about the the structures and the footings and making sure that that assembly um, would be able to stand the frost and be stable. And I think if if the town hasn't already received stamped engineering drawings for that particular construction method, it's something you could we could request. Um, and, and that's where an engineer would would you know stand behind that that methodology, or would I let us know if there was something wrong with it. Um, and the other one was a sight line implication. And as I was pulling out from that drive, I almost got hit by a Jeep. Um, and so there's a little bit of a sight line issue due to the vegetation right on right on the road. And again, that that's something that we might want to look at if that's jurisdictional or not, or if any any pruning of branches could happen with, with that. Um, but overall, it's it's phenomenal. It's going to be a great place to experience and walk. And the fact there's accessibility. And there's demonstration areas for um, for succession and restoration. It's just a tremendous jewel for, for our town. Thanks, Rachel. Um, I just want to get a show of hands from commissioners. Um, so one of the things that we need to consider is whether this is a minor amendment, a minor administrative change is being requested by the applicant, or is this a formal amendment process? So the difference is, is this a negligible, um, change to the plan, or is this a substantive change to the order or the plans? So if there's any questions that you need to ask before you raise your hand, please do that, um, because that's probably where we need to start out. So those in favor of making this a uh, minor administrative change, please raise your hand. Okay, so minor administrative change is something that we could act on right away. A formal amendment is something that would require um, a butter notifications, um, resubmission of all of the things. So just everybody seems to be in favor of requiring a formal amendment. Raise your hand for a formal amendment. Okay. I see a majority for a formal amendment. Um, all right, well, that's important to know. Um, I'm not sure we can move forward with this tonight under that. So Aaron, is that basically the information that we need to determine how we're gonna move forward with this in, in our hearing setting? You're on mute. Aaron, you're on mute. Sorry. I think it's critically important um, to know what direction the commission is going with this. So I think that's really valuable information for the applicant. Um, and yeah, I see the applicant has his hand up. So um, probably, and I also see a member of the public as well. So just as an FYI. Okay. Sorry. I can't see people that don't have their. Um, okay. Jason, I'm going to go to you and then we'll bring in Lawrence. Thank you. I would like to hear from everybody at the site visit to get their opinions on the condition of the site prior to potentially making a decision. I'm still a little unclear as far as the formal amendment versus the minor change as to what it is that we are asking them to amend or what they're or what they're asking us if they can amend. Um, it seemed like it was just the schedule or like the 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 process by which they move on to another section of the project. Uh, yeah. Last. And for me, a big consideration of that was the existing condition of the site. And I wasn't okay. going to make the site visit, so I'd like to hear from folks. That's yeah. my opinion before making that decision. Aaron, can you pull up? maybe the letter that we have where it lists the actual orders of condition. So we have an order of condition for this, and there are four conditions that lay out the phasing. So for example, site or area one has to be done before area you move on to area two, et cetera. And the point of that was to 
protect against, um, you know, major erosion or site destabilization events in the case of weather events. So there are probably four orders of conditions they're asking us to waive in favor of them going forward with just doing it all at once when they're proposing to do this within the month. Um, the minor, the minor administrative change requires really no attached documented change to our orders of condition. Um, and so it's less protective against how we want to manage the site and potential um, impacts the site given any kind of uncertainty during the timeline of construction. So um, the minor administrative change is basically like, a, yes, we can go ahead and do that. And we've done this before several times with this project um, and they're asking for another one. So here, as we can see those that first numbered points are the four conditions that they want us to waive. And again, those were instituted just to protect the site from destabilization. Um, hopefully everybody reviewed this, but again, it came in a bit late, so possibly not. Yeah, this was only put in the packets today because it came in late yesterday. Um, but there was a, an email, which I also attached, that provided a little information on the stabilization measures that had come in last Thursday afternoon. Okay, so they've come with their proposed timing and proposed stabilization measures. So basically, are we assessing whether this is a major change, the order of conditions, or is this a minor administrative change that is non-substantive and we can just move forward with it um, without a formal amendment? Is there anything else I we'd like to relay in terms of the differences between those pathways, Erin? Um, so with the, as, as Michelle explained with the minor administrative change, the commission can simply, you know, take a vote and, and approve it, um, in an administrative capacity with a formal amendment, it requires legal ad, a butter notifications and holding a public hearing to take comment on it. Um, and and in that instance, we would actually reissue the order of conditions um, with adjustments. So that that kind of highlights the distinction a little bit more. Thanks, Aaron. Okay, um, Alex and Dave, and I'd like to hear from Lawrence too. Go ahead, Alex. I get a little lost in the administrative changes. There's nothing really to look back on on what it was we actually agreed to. And they, if they build on each other, we lose sight of the project. When I was out on the um, site visit, it was plain and Lawrence pointed out that we had an or a phased approach to put um, solar panels on the Eastern site and then see how it worked out and then put them on the Western site. Dave's out there pretty much weekly, Aaron's out there. There was a decision made to flip-flop the phasing that did not come back to the commission. And um, and Dave and Aaron didn't bring it up either to advise us that that phasing was going to get changed. Um, all of the, when we went out there, all of the uh, stanchions um, were in for the solar panels on the western site which was supposed to be phase two so a decision was made maybe by aaron and dave that that was okay to change the phasing and to go ahead and construct um, and with that will be the panels or the um, pads for the electrical system and the batteries and when I asked Lawrence, what's the status with the batteries? And, and I said, the manufacturer has probably gone to great length to fix the problem that caused the fires. And he goes, yes, they've added several items to the inside of the batteries. And I said, did they service your batteries? And he said, no, not yet. I said, when will that happen? 
And he said, after the batteries are transported to this site, because whatever is being put in the batteries is delicate and might get damaged during, during transit. And I said, so you mean to tell me that the fire department is going to okay these batteries once they get here? And he said, yes. So there's a whole lot going on in this project that we're sort of losing sight of. And I think it would be time to come back together and talk about what's happening. Things are, lots of things are happening. We're not informed. And so I think starting uh, another administrative change just continues uh, our losing sight of the project. And this is important to the town. It's important to Dave that it go well. It would be embarrassing if it didn't go well. And so I, I think uh, that's why I favor coming back to a process where we can understand very clearly what it is we're approving. In an administrative change, we say, yeah, work it out with Dave and Aaron. And then um, that, that, uh, that's convenient, but this is a mature company. And I think um, what I saw coming in at the last minute past the deadline in an email was a bulleted list of what they wanted. Didn't look particularly professional. And um, I, I don't think it's respectful. So I would like to go back to the drawing board and uh, um, not have uh, another series of administrative changes. Thanks, Alex. So Alex has made a um, in favor proposition for a formal amendment and not a minor administrative change. Go ahead, Dave. Sure, a couple of just clarifying points. Um, first of all, Alex, and others, whether it's important to Dave or not is not the question before you tonight. It's really, you know, I want to keep, I don't want to personalize this project or or Pure Sky Solar's project or Hickory Ridge. It's not about me. It's about what the, the commission is comfortable with. Um, I want to also make it clear that at no time did Aaron or Dave or me give permission for Pure Sky to, to move forward. So I think that 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 responsibility rests solely with with Lawrence and his team. And I'm sure I, I would like to hear from him. We haven't really heard from him tonight. Um, I also wanna make sure that we get back to Jason's question, which I thought was really quite relevant to this whole conversation, which is he asked moments ago, what is the current condition of the site? And I think Rachel, Alex, um, who else was on that site visit, Aaron? I think it's really important for the commission to hear what is the current condition of the site? Because regardless of whether you think this is a major amendment or minor amendment, I, whichever way you wanna go on that is fine. But I think it's really important for the whole commission to hear what is the current condition of the site? Um, I would, I would uh, put it out there that the current condition of the site is, is stable and it has been throughout and it is in very good shape, but I'd like to hear from Rachel uh, or Alex on what your impression of the site was. So I want to get that answered, but I, I'd also like the commission to hear from Lawrence. It's his proposal um, that you're considering tonight. So those are my quick comments. You say, yep, we're going to Lawrence next. I can't see Lawrence, so sorry, Lawrence, you're... Yeah. But that's okay. I, I tend not to go on video because I wander around when I'm on the phone and it just ends up looking like the Blair Witch Project. And I'm sure you all don't need the motion sickness, but I can go on video if you prefer. Um, but thank you for allowing me to speak tonight. The The proposal before you is solely to do with the restructuring of the phasing, which was included on the uh, submitted site plans. I am not asking for a waiver. Uh, from the CONCOM to uh, amend those conditions to remove any of the inspections or any of the um, uh, things that uh, that were required within those conditions. Um, it is just purely uh, an adjustment of the phasing. So we build the west side and then the east side instead of the east side and then the west side. There's obviously uh, no additional work or, or anything that's, uh, that's encompassed with that. Um, that is still the plan. Um, obviously, then it's the uh, uh, and to build the pads while we are building the arrays um, uh, to 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 
to to bring that forward. Again, no additional work, no additional um, uh, impacts to the wetlands or anything like that. It just changes the time at, at which we build them. So in my mind, they are minor. We aren't coming back with a battery proposal yet because we are still working with the fire department with their peer reviewer um, to get the permission from them. And we will come back, as previously discussed, to discuss the batteries once we have the fire department's approval to proceed on that basis. Um, I'm not. We're not saying that just because the pads are going to be built, we're going to install the batteries before the concoms have the opportunity to weigh in or anything like that. That is that is not what we're suggesting that we we want to do. That is going to be a, a separate meeting when the time is right, when the fire department have uh, have weighed in with the, with their views on the uh, on that proposal. Um, there is a slight misremembering um, that Alex is having about that discussion. I explained that there has been some stuff that's happened in the factory, including the testing and the inspections and things like that. But there are some measures um, that have been recommended to, to do with, uh, with some of the waterproofing that happened when the batteries arrive on site. It is obviously typical. You take things out, you inspect everything. Uh, when something is, is being delivered in site to, to verify for damage and, and things like that. And at that time is when those things are put in. So it, it, it's not a question that we're going to leave completely un, uh, unchecked, unimproved, un, uh, un everything batteries on, on pads while, while we wait around to, to, to do it. They're, they're, they are perfectly safe the day they arrive. The additional measures that are going in uh, are ones that happen um, because to, to avoid any damage that happens during transit. Um, there have been other questions about um, the, uh, uh, the, the the foundation design. There is an engineer of record that has stamped a plan that has been submitted to the building permit, the, the building department, and it has, it has been issued on that basis. There is testing that happens on site with uh, it's called pull testing. So after we install the, uh, the the piles, we we have we rig them up to a testing machine and make sure that they're passing the uh, the, the minimum requirements set by the engineers. All of that is taking place. Um, I, I'm not sure quite what the concom's involvement would be on the structural aspects of a of a foundation um but that but i'm happy to discuss it if the, if the if the concom wants to discuss it but yes we do have an engineered plan we do have uh testing requirements and we do have uh, structural analysis all of that has been submitted as part of the building permit thanks lawrence um we don't need to discuss that so it's not our purview but thank you for answering the question so it's it's stamped we're going to remove the battery component from this conversation we're just talking about the phasing of the panels so i just i want to hone us back in um and thank you for answering all the bigger picture questions lawrence so the site is currently stable um i think that gives us the picture and just again to talk about um, specifically what we're considering, which is like changing the phasing, which is in the order of the conditions. The phasing was there to minimize the impacts during construction or and to manage them and to have some control over them. Okay, I've got three hands up. Um, I think Rachel is first. Go ahead, Rachel. Um, just to answer Jason's question, the site was is stable. Um, the bare areas in the photographs are the gravel road base. Um, the other areas around the future panels are vegetated currently. Um, there were a couple of bare patches, but they were not significant and they will be, you know, they will be reseeded. Um, the erosion control barriers were in place around the perimeter of the work area. The site was clean and stable and there was a significant set down area that had um, thick layers of the mulch and it was very and it was stabilized. So the site was stable as is. Um, and Lawrence can correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the, the reason for the switch we were told is due to some undulations in the topography and um, they had to re-engineer or look at the structures themselves on and the first where they had first planned to install the structures and that's why they moved to the other site um, due to timing. Um, Thanks. I don't think we were notified of it, but... Okay. It would happen. Okay. Um, Andre. Yeah, I think Bruce was ahead of me there. Bruce. Bruce waved it off. Yeah. All right. I have uh my question is is for uh, Lawrence. Um if you could, Lawrence, uh you know, you guys uh you're uh, the you had agreed to an order of conditions, and uh, we've we've made a couple of changes, and 
the reason why we had um, the tiered, you know, I'm, I'm not sure, Lawrence, if you understood uh, the reason why there is a tiered, um, uh, a tiered build uh, there, Lawrence, do you? No, I do. It's a section of the resource in the Fort River Solo. Yep. Mm -hmm. And uh, essentially what happens is that you know, if something goes wrong when two of these, when they're both, uh, both sides are being worked on, then that's that much more logistics that you're going to have to go through to, uh, to ensure that, uh, that it's, uh, stabilized, et cetera. And two things, two, you're going to have to keep your eyes on both, uh, uh, both sides, if you would. Um, what Lawrence We're asking uh, to build both sides at the same time it, it would sorry? still we aren't asking to build both sides at the same time the the phasing would still be with the disturbance the 50 percent and the inspections it's just that we would build the west array rather than the east array so you're you're just so you're only looking to uh to do the switch that uh build build the east array we talking about yeah. earlier yeah, build build the west array before we do the east array. The the, the same thing would apply. The fifty percent would happen when um, uh, 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 would be inspected before we could start work on the next array, uh, on on the next side of it. Um, the the only thing that we're 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 moving up is to do with the two pads and the motivation to get the pads done now is because the the timing of that based on the if 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 we stick to the current phasing. The timing of those pads going in will be um, late November, early December, and so we would miss the, uh, the, the what we have remaining of the growing season. So that's why we want to get it in now, when we still got a chance using things like winter rye uh, and and the uh, the winter erosion mixes and things like that, um, so that we can get at least some growth going uh, this growing season uh, with the additional measures that I've proposed in that letter um, to do with the the mulching and the the additional um, uh, things around it to to uh, uh, to, pre uh, to 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 prevent any erosion over the winter months. Sure. So then, what uh, that brings up the question of the uh, of the concrete. How's the concrete um, going to uh, going to set um, when it's so uh, when it's so cold? Is concrete sets in the in in the cold? Just takes yeah. a little longer. You can put accelerants in it as well. That would. Uh, would allow for it to uh, uh to cure but the the the, the, mm -hmm. the temperatures uh over the next couple of months concrete will cure just fine okay thank you alex yeah um, um the decision was made i'm not quite sure when lawrence can straight it out but there i think their original proposal was to have stationary panels and it's 40 percent more effective to have panels that rotate with the sun. So the decision was made to have panels that don't move east to west, but they do move up and down so that they are always um, an optimal angle to the sun. And that requires flat ground. So when they wanted to do that, the Western site is flat for all intents and purposes. The Eastern site is undulating and it would have worked when they had stationary panels, but in order to put rotating panels up, they have to take off the top of the hill on the Eastern end. And so that's that's behind the flip-flop of the order. And um, I'm, I, I have not frankly gone back to the details that, that we approved to figure out what's changed. All I know is that um, we haven't heard from them much, and there's there's been changes on the fly for reasons that are very explainable. But uh, we're going to be dealing with pure sky. Um, ex we expect to be, be dealing with pure sky on the uh, Shootsbury Road project. And um, um, I, I think... I. It, it would be good to have a better working relationship with Pure Sky. I don't know if Lawrence is going to be involved with that other project, but it's still Pure Sky. It's, pure, it's still the same company. And um, I would like to dampen down 
on the changes that take place on the fly. Thanks, Alex. Um, yeah, I I mean, obviously, we're not, we can't tie this into any other project going forward, but having lots of these changes happening, it feels like this has run away a little bit. And I, to be honest, Lawrence, I'm a little disappointed in the level of detail that we received, because clearly there's some quite a bit of confusion among the commissioners about what's being asked and where it applies to and what the impacts are and what the contingencies are. And that is something that we talked about last time. For example, um, it sounded to me from some staff updates that uh, a lot of the time benchmarks haven't been made so far. And so what I'm thinking about is what if you don't get it done on time? And what if we get into January and it's very dry now, but what if it's not in two months and it doesn't look like in this email, there's really any contingency for a stop work or, um, you know, reapply some phasing or anything like that. So it, it, it concerns me that approving this, you know, this email list of one through eight timing doesn't really cover us for um, events that we are not expecting and that may destabilize the site that it may not look like it's a problem now, but it could in the future. And we just really haven't covered that base with any of this. So um, as far as approving a minor administrative change based on the information in front of us right now, um, which I don't even know if the commissioners have, I don't think we can do that tonight. Um, so at the very least, I would suggest having some kind of more appropriate and comprehensive plan that does also cover some unexpected or unplanned timeline um, aspects. Um, we still, we, we did about, you know, 15 minutes of discussion on this commissioner. So I want to revisit the idea about whether or not, um, your interest in moving forward as a minor administrative change now that there's been some clarity from Lawrence about what exactly he's asking. So it's not necessarily, a, it's, it's a flipping in the West versus East and also a, doing the pads all at the same time. And just one thing to keep in mind there is that there's vehicle traffic involved and that's not something we really talked about, but it will be heavy equipment going in and out of the site. Uh, Bruce. I'm noting that there's a member of the public with a hand raised. Yep, thanks Bruce. Alex. I just want to remind you that this was not in the published agenda. The public was not notified that we're gonna talk about this. And I think the commission needs to be wary of conducting business on very visible projects without including it in the agenda. Yeah, well, I don't want to. That doesn't that doesn't mean there has to be a hearing, but it means the name Hickory Ridge needs to be in the agenda that gets published so that it, at least people in the public know or have the opportunity to know that we're going to be talking about it. And in this particular instance, uh, we're allowing that discussion go on, which is fairly lengthy without notifying the public. And I think that's wrong. I mean, I agree to some extent, Alex, but it would be sort of unfair to any smaller project that also has a butters and interested parties to not apply that to them. So in some ways, this is pretty much our standard procedure unless we change every single time that we don't discuss other business that was received. Put, this like, is not outside. a small project. I know, but some smaller projects might have just as invested a butters. I mean, it it's relative. So I we're not moving on this tonight, but I would like to hear from the commission if you're willing to move forward with a minor amendment tonight, because that will change the instructions that we give to the project proponent. So again, show of hands, who is willing to move forward with a minor amendment versus a for a minor administrative change versus a formal amendment. The minor administrative change being the one that we can just vote on easily without any additional voter notifications, order of new order of conditions, or any formal paperwork. Okay. Minor administrative change, please raise your hand. I see one hand up. Or who is undecided hand up? Okay, so it looks like we have some decisiveness on um, request for a formal amendment. Okay, Michael Lipinski. Um, Aaron, can you please allow Michael to talk? 
Hi, I'm Mike Lipinski, 167 Shootsbury Road in Amherst. Um, I want to reiterate what's been said about not having this item on the agenda. I'm only here because I'm really stubborn. And I stayed here sitting through many, many other sessions. Some of them were pretty interesting. But only because I'm stubborn am I here to hear this because there was no mention on the agenda that this was going to take place. And something that would be considered major by you guys, I think is something that the public, or at least some members of the public would be interested in. So I think it's important to at least put the words Hickory Ridge in your agenda. I think the most important thing that's come out here tonight is that Pure Sky basically has been doing what it wants, when it wants, without permission. Dave and Aaron supposedly have been supervising this project closely, and yet you have these, you have had trenches and conduit and concentrators put on both arrays. That doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen in one day. That's been ongoing. It's something that should be visible. They said that they did not give Pure Sky permission to do that. Pure Sky just did it. You have a whole Western array now of posts that are set that no one gave them permission to do. And yet now you're talking about amending the conditions. Well, they've already amended the conditions themselves. They have just are running wild and doing what they feel like. I think that's a major concern. And this is a town project that's being closely supervised. Can you imagine what they're like when they're not closely supervised? So I'm very concerned about the fact that all this work has been done, supposedly that's supervised by the town, but these guys have been doing this stuff without permission and it's big things. Um, one last thing is the site looked great. It hasn't rained in, appreciably in three months. That's why it looks great. Um, it's a major concern when it's wet there. One last thing, and it's a little off subject, but I think it's important. The emergency exit, my understanding is that that's being built on a grass road or a packed grass or something. Think about it. When would the emergency exit be used? It would be used when Fort River is flooded. Why would the Fort River be flooded? Because there had been a period of very heavy rains or heavy snow melt. You now have the emergency exit with fire trucks coming down it, going across a soaking wet Hickory Ridge grass road. I think that that's a major concern that you could get fire trucks just sinking down to the hubcaps in the mud. So I think someone needs to think about what that road should look like because the only time it's gonna be used is in those conditions. I think that's all I have to say for tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Okay. Um, what I'm hearing from the commission is a fairly big deal. So I just want to take one more show of hands to confirm the affirmative that everybody here, you know, minus Rachel, perhaps first last vote is interested in seeing a formal amendment to the order of conditions um, to update our order of conditions to change the phasing criteria. Okay. What was the? I'm confused. Okay. You say it's Please raise your hand. Please raise your hand if you support a formal amendment to the order of conditions. Okay. I see a majority, so that means that's how we're going to be moving forward with this. Um, is there anything else that we need to provide to the applicant, Aaron, tonight? Lauren to has his uh, hand up. I just okay. Sorry. There we go. Go ahead, Lawrence. Uh, I mean, it, it doesn't really matter now. It's just going to sort of clarify things that the, the, the panels changing was part of the original notice of intent. It was an old design from several years ago with the fixed tilt. Um, the, most of the undulations uh, are going to be dealt with by the minor grading that we've already got the permission for. We're just talking about getting some longer posts, which is what are needed for the, uh, for, for the majority of that Western array. Um, and yeah, it, it was just really to say that we're not proposing any new additional work or anything other than that. It is just changing how we approach the existing work that's already been reviewed and approved by the uh, by the CONCOM. 
Thanks, Lauren. I, Lawrence, I guess I would just reiterate that there was a reason for the phasing to begin with, which was to protect the site from impacts given extreme weather events or just uncertain timelines. Um, and I guess just in the future for any kind of requests for minor administrative changes, um, a more formal and informative and detailed package for us to review would probably be helpful in speeding up the process or giving enough information to the commissioners to help us make our decision. Um, I mean, otherwise, I want this to see this project move forward as quickly as possible. I think we just need to be confident that we know what's going on out there and that it's protected in the way that the Conservation Commission needs it to be protected. Uh, is there anything else we need to do to wrap this one up tonight, Erin? Um, I think uh, I'll just need to debrief with Lawrence offline to determine sort of next steps um, because I know there's other there's other pieces to this that would require an amendment and it seems like it would make more sense to do one one amendment rather than um, multiple because that's kind of there's obviously a, a process involved with that and so um, yeah I I think that there's a little more discussion that needs to be had relative to when that process takes place, what it will entail, and what it will include. Okay, um, so I guess we'll have a bigger discussion later, which will be on the agenda and available for the public to attend. Okay, thank you, Lawrence. Um, I guess we'll be in touch. Uh, all right, is that it for tonight? If there's any last public comment, please raise your hand. Otherwise, I think we're good. Michael, I still see your hand up. Did you have something additional or? Yeah, okay, we're good. All right, well, looking for a motion to adjourn, commissioners. I motion to adjourn. Second. Jason on the motion, Bruce on the second. Rachel? Aye. Jason? Aye. Alex? Aye. It is 9.50. Thank you, Alex. Bruce? Aye. Andre? Aye and good night. <laughs> good night. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Good night, everybody. Thank good night. You.